Greetings, fellow devotees of the Warhammer 40 universe. Welcome to Alex Gordon Audios, the sanctuary of the Emperor's finest tales. By subscribing to our channel, you become a guardian of the Emperor's wisdom, preserving these stories for future generations and strengthening the bonds of our community. Together, we honor the Emperor and celebrate the intricate tapestry of the Warhammer Forkit universe. In the Emperor's name, let our audiobooks be a beacon of enlightenment. Have Imperator. Chapter 15 Janet Sulla screamed in defiance and righteous hatred as she smashed in the head of the grotesque, monstrous thing that had managed to reach the defensive line with the butt of her last gun. It burst with a sickening crunch, and the stench of its brain fluids nearly made her gag inside her rebreather, despite the freezing temperature which permeated the entire cold side. Like all of the enemy on Adumbria, it was a grotesque thing of flayed muscles and elongated bone, dripping with disgusting fluids and moving in ways that it shouldn't be able to. Knowing that at some point it had been a human being before the fell contagion, which had spread across this world had taken hold of its flesh, only made it more abhorrent. Around her, her comrades, the women of the 296th Valhalan Infantry, and the militia raised from the planet's surviving PDF, law enforcers and anybody who could hold a Lars rifle, continued to fire at the latest bunch of monstrosities which had made their way through the freezing, perpetual night of Adumbria's cold side laid dead on the ground. As the regiment's quartermaster, Sulla wasn't normally expected to get into the thick of the fray herself, but this throne dam situation didn't allow any guardswoman of the 296th the luxury of staying away from the fighting to defend Glacier Peak. When the 296th had arrived on Adumbria, it had been to help maintain public order on an important trade world after a handful of escalating incidents. But, a week after their arrival, the hand behind those incidents had revealed they had lost the capital in less than a day, as swarms of infected that had been kept hidden in the Undersity rose in a series of coordinated attacks that decapitated every branch of Adumbria's government and turned the city's entire population into more infected. Glacier Peak's location, near the geographical center of Adumbria's cold side, made it ideally suited for a smaller force to hold on against a seemingly numberless host, the freezing climate which reminded Sulla and her sisters of their homeworld, meant that over half of the infected hordes had already frozen to death by the time they reached the settlement, and it was testament to the unholy strength of their monstrous forms that any survived the perilous trek. Not even the Valhallans would have survived such a trek, e before the collapse of imperial order on Adumbria. The only ways to reach Glacier Peak had been through train or by hitching a ride on one of the vast crawlers which kept the scattered handful of settlements of the cold side linked together. The vast tunnels of the mining complex had been converted into makeshift shelters for the waves of refugees pouring in from across the shadow belt, then penned of land running from one pole of the rotationally locked planet to the other, where temperatures were more suitable for human inhabitation as they fled from the infected hordes. Earlier during the conflict, a system had been put into place to use the large crawlers and other engines meant to carry the product of the cold side mines to the spaceport in order to bring these innocent folk to safety, which had been a nightmarish logistical challenge, but one that Sulla and her team had managed to overcome with the assistance of the local administratum. Eventually, they'd been forced to detonate the train lines which had run straight from Glacier Peak to the planetary capital Skitterfall after they had been overwhelmed with the infect. An entire company of the 296th, including their previous colonel bravely laying down their lives in a rearguard action to buy enough time for the demolition teams. Regardless, Glacier Peak had only been home to some 30,000 souls before this, and was now packed with over 200,000 refugees at the last count. They had been forced to set up draconian food rationing in order to keep everyone from starving, and if not for the strength sapping cold, and the constant threat of the infected there might already have been rioting among the desperate civilians. A handful of daring sorties had managed to secure more foodstuffs, but Sulla was bitterly aware that this was merely delaying the inevitable e. If they didn't get help from off-world, then sooner or later they would all starve. Of course, there was always the chance that the infected would kill them all long before that became a problem, 
Sulla reflected grimly as she took aim and opened fire at another wave of the living blasphemies. For all the advantages of their defensive position, they still took casualties with every assault, and the infection and the endless night took their own toll on the defenders, no matter what their commanding officers said to prevent panic. Everyone in Glacier Peak knew they were all living on borrowed time, and sooner or later they would... Great fireballs bloomed amidst the ranks of the infected, obliterating dozens of them at a time. The snow-covered ground beneath Sulla's feet shook under the impact, but she managed to keep her balance, raising her head to the forever black sky. She saw planes flying overhead, underlit by the radiance of their own ordnance, or at least she guessed those were planes I in all her years in the Imperial Guard. She had never seen anything with that kind of silhouette. Within moments, the entire hundred-strong horde had been reduced to a few stragglers which continued to advance toward the barricade, heedless of the carnage around them. Shaking herself, Sulla barked an order and they were promptly finished off by focused fire. Sulla knew that the few surviving aircrafts of the 296 had long since been grounded for lack of fuel, and the PDF's own engines had either suffered the same fate or been ingloriously lost before even taking off when their airfields had been overwhelmed by infected swarms. And even if that hadn't been the case, and the colonel had decided to deploy some previously unknown reserve, she would have heard about it on the Vox. Which meant there was only one explanation for this miracle. One which was further confirmed as reports began to come in of troop transports landing further afield and disgorging hundreds of soldiers in red armor. Sulla could have wept. Help. By the God Emperor's mercy, help had finally come. Regina forced herself to remain stoic as the envoy approached her. He was clad in the uniform of a Valhallen Imperial Guard, with the thick fur coat which was assigned to every soldier raised from her homeworld. I am acting Colonel Regina Castine of the Valhallen 296, she said, doing her best not to show how utterly relieved she felt nor the doubt from the fact that she held that rank only by virtue of being the most senior officer to have survived the disastrous retreat from Skitterfall. To whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? I am Vaslo Krulde, captain of the Valhallen in 18th. Pleasure to meet you, Co. Regina blinked. She recognized the regiment. Obviously, there probably wasn't a single Valhallen who wouldn't. I heard the Tundra Wolves had been lost, Captain, she said cautiously. Destroyed to the last in battle against the heretic's inquisitor, Karamazov waged his last crusade against. Lost. Yes, confirmed Crawled. Destroyed. Well, almost, but not quite. Shenkov didn't manage to get us all killed before he got what was coming to him. Realization battled with disbelief within Regina. You surrendered, she breathed out, the words sounding like the accusation they were. He blushed. We did, yeah. It was either that, die pointlessly in a suicide charge, or wait until we starve to death. He said, anyway, the boss thought you would like seeing someone from the homeworld. Don't ask me how he knew you were here, because I've no idea. So he brought me along and asked me to make contact first. We are here to help you, Colonel. And from what I see, you need all the help you can. The boss. He's here, then, she asked. He is, confirmed Krulde. And he wants to talk with you directly. The captain pulled out a small device from his pocket and held it in front of him, before pressing a rune to turn it on. Regina raised an eyebrow as she realized what it, what it was. She'd never seen such a small hololithic projector before, and when it turned on, the life-sized image was far crisper and the sound clearer than she was used to. Siafus Kane had come to Adumbria ready for war, and his attire showed it. He wore a suit of armor like that of the Crimson Troopers deployed around Glacier Peak, but with many more decorations, and a chainsword and bolt pistol hung from his belt. His face showed no sign of his corruption. Had Regina not known who he was, she'd have found him the very image of an imperial hero. Colonel Castine, said the heretic who'd successfully overthrown an imperial governor and then gone on to defeat an inquisitor and one of Valhalla's most infamous sons. I am Syaphas Kane. I know who you are, she replied. The military made sure we all knew you after what happened. Really, he raised an eyebrow. I would have thought, I never mind, that isn't important. What is important is the offer I wish to make to you, your troops, and the people under your protection. 
Regina's hand tightened around the service weapon at her waist, hearing the unspoken threat hiding behind the words. And what offers that? Do not attempt to fight us, he replied bluntly. There is little you could do anyway, and we have no hostile intentions toward you. Our only enemy here is the source of the plague which has beset this world. Regardless of our allegiances, we are all members of the human race and share a common enemy here. If you accept this, not only will we not do you harm, we will also share with you our supplies, including our medical expertise. From what our Auspex readings are telling regarding how many people are packed in your city, you can use all the help you can get. We have food and medical supplies, enough to keep everyone alive, and even help rebuild civilization once the infection has been cleansed. It sounded too good to be true, which immediately made Regina even more suspicious. She pointed out the most obvious issue. If we accept your offer, there will be no returning to the Imperium for us. Consorting with rebels is a capital offense. He looked at her with what she felt was genuine sadness and compassion in his gaze. Oh, Colonel, I'm afraid it's already too late for that. Why do you think no reinforcements have been sent from the Imperium to relieve you? Regina frowned, then scowled. Because defences across the entire sector were thrown into chaos by Karamazov's failed attempt to bring your lot to justice, and High Command has more pressing concerns than this world. Well, partly because of that, yes, he admitted, although I would argue we are not to blame for Karamazov's stupidity. But it's not just that there are other fronts needing resources. No one is coming here ever. Adumbria has been declared perdition due to the warp-born plague that erupted here. You and your regiment, along with everyone on this planet and aboard the ships in the system, have already been declared dead. For a moment, Regina stood, stunned. She wanted to reject the heretic's words, denounce them as nothing but lies, but she couldn't. It had been months since the fall of Skitterfall, and she knew the astropaths had managed to get out one last call for help before the tower housing them had self-destructed to keep them from the infected. Someone should have come by now, if only to burn the planet to ash with orbital bombardment, or, Emperor forbid, the fires of Exterminatus. If you still had astropaths, you would have received the proclamation, he continued, not unkindly. It was spread across the sector to ensure everyone knew what to do in case any ship known to have been in the system arrived seeking asylum. It was us receiving it that made us decide to come here to your aid. Why? Regina managed to say. Why did you come here? What do you want? First and foremost, to assist our fellow human beings where it is in our power to do so. Regina made no attempt to keep what she thought of that from showing on her face, and Cain sighed. But I understand that such altruistic motives are difficult to accept coming from me, so I will give you a more pragmatic reason. What do you know of the warp and the powers that dwell within it? I have no desire to listen to your heresies. Yes, yes, I know. He waved her off. I promise I'm not going to try to convert you away from the God Emperor. But you're an officer of the Imperial Guard. Surely you already know about the rivalry between the Chaos Gods. He looked at her, and her lack of understanding must have shown on her face. Oh, brilliant. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? To put it very, very briefly, the eye forces of chaos are far from united and constantly struggle against each other for supremacy. On Slorkenberg, we have achieved a rare balance between three of the four dark gods. This, as you might imagine, hasn't especially endeared us with the fourth, which is the very same power behind the corruption that has taken root on this world. That made sense. Regina might not know much about the ruinous powers, nor had she any desire to do so, but their disunity was legendary and featured prominently in imperial works of propaganda, not even the Despoiler. That ancient monster that dwelled in the Eye of Terror beyond the Cadian Gate could keep the hordes of Chaos united under his command for long. Ten years ago, he all but declared war on Nurgle. Cain spat the name, and Regina felt a shiver down her spine at the foul word. Ever since then, we have been on the lookout for any response. When we heard what was happening here, we knew we had found it. So you are here to protect yourselves, knowing that if Adumbria falls to this plague, you will be next in its sights. Feel free to think of it that way, yes. But regardless of why we've come, we are the only help you are going to get. 
You spoke of rivalry between the servants of the ruinous powers. Would that be why the ravagers attacked the capital? I'm sorry. The ravagers? You don't know. You aren't the first heretics to come to Adumbria. Around a month ago, a handful of starships arrived and crushed the SDF. We thought they were here to break the quarantine and spread the infection, but their flagship was destroyed by some kind of unholy weapon at Skitterfall, and the survivors made a suicide attack on the capital. I see, he mused. Interesting. I didn't know about this, but you are probably correct. The Ravagers must have come to stop the source of the plague. They were just, shall we say, less diplomatic about it. That was certainly one way to put it, thought Regina. I will let you consider your options, said Kane. When you make your decision, tell Captain Cruelled. Oh, and please don't kill him or try to take him prisoner. It wouldn't end well for anyone. The hololithic projector turned off, leaving Regina face to face with Krelled. The renegade captain looked at her hesitantly for a moment, before saying, I know it's a lot to take in, but Kane can be trusted. He promised to treat us well if we surrendered, and he did. And when the orcs attacked Slorkenberg ten years back, he gave us guns so we could defend ourselves, even though we could have used them on him and his folks. And they haven't forbidden us to pray to the god emperor either. There are still temples to him on Slorkenberg, smaller than they used to be, sure, but a lot less gaudy too, and the priests in them sound a hell of a lot more sincere and trustworthy than Karamazov's sermons ever did. You want me to take his offer? Regina asked disbelievingly. To betray my oaths to the golden throne and drag the women under my command along with me into damnation? He shrugged, looking distinctly uncomfortable. I wouldn't put it like that. The way I see it, you and your girls are fracked through no fault of your own. And I don't doubt that you are ready to die fighting if that's what it comes to. But your lives aren't the only ones at stake here. Do you really think the Emperor wants you to die for nothing? To condemn the civilians you've been protecting to a slow, miserable death? The Emperor expects us to fight his enemies no matter the cost, Regina replied by reflex. Who said anything about Cain being his enemy? He's against the Imperium, sure, but I've never heard him say anything against the Emperor. The Emperor and the Imperium are one. And who decided that? Krold sighed. Anyway, I'm not a philosopher. Facts are, Cain is going to fight the monsters here regardless of what you decide. Us coming here was really more about him recognizing your efforts in holding up until now and wanting to help you for protecting the civilians. He's very particular about that, a lot more than fracking Chenkov ever was for sure. Much as it galled Regina to admit, Krulled had a point. The few hundred women under her command had proven themselves capable warriors, but Kane had brought thousands of power-armored troopers along with mechanized and air support. It was one thing to hold Glacier Peak against hordes of uncoordinated monsters, and another to do so against a proper army with experience fighting the Imperial Guard. At the very least, continued the captain, I'm hoping you won't do anything stupid and throw your lives away trying to take down the USA. I've no doubt you're a better tactician than Chenkov, but that's not going to amount to much. Kane is fracking terrifying in a fight. He killed Chenkov and Karamazov by himself, the latter after boarding his ship while he was preparing to unleash exterminators. He fought an orc warboss in that fancy armor of his, then climbed out of the wrecked suit and dealt with an elder raid while he was at it. Regina thought back on the tall, confident warlord she had met and found that she could believe he had done all these things, however impossible they sounded. Beyond that, though, he really isn't a bad ruler. I don't know what you've heard about what happened on Slorkenberg, but I've talked with a lot of people who lived there, and it wasn't pretty. There's a reason almost nobody resisted his takeover, and he's genuinely made things better for everyone. I've been on a handful of planets in my time, and none of them were as happy, I suppose is the best word for it. Regina had never given any thought to what life might be like on worlds lost to the Imperium. If she had, though, she would probably have imagined some hellish realm with endless blood sacrifices and suffering, with monsters preying on a terrified population while a handful of powerful heretics lived in debauchery within their twisted citadels. From Krull's description, it seemed she'd been mistaken. Of course, he could be lying, but Regina thought she was quite good at reading people and she didn't think he was. Biased, certainly, since the 296th following in the Twelfth's footsteps would confirm he and his comrades had done the right thing ten years ago.
but not lying. She thought of the millions who had already died on Adumbria and of the thousands who yet remained, looking to her for safety on a world gone mad. She thought of their ever-dwindling supplies, of the sickness that was spreading among the refugees even beyond the infection. She'd sworn an oath to protect them, no matter the cost to her. Regina Castine made her decision. It was with mixed feelings that I received the news that Colonel Castine had accepted my offer of a truce and cooperation against our common foe. On the one hand, I was relieved that I wouldn't have to order the USA to slaughter loyal Imperial soldiers who had performed admirably well in an impossible situation. On the other, I might just have started another regiment of the Guard down the path of heresy, and that ran quite literally against everything I'd been taught to believe. I'd no doubt that, had her regiment's assigned commissar not perished alongside most of the command staff during the disastrous flight from the capital, things would have been much more complicated. While it was perfectly understandable for the daughters of Valhalla to be furious at the world being callously abandoned by the Imperium, in truth it was more complicated than that. Adumbria stood at the crossroads of several warp routes, and as such was far more important to the sector's strategic interests than Strakenberg ever had been. High Command wouldn't have given up on it so easily, and from the various divinations performed by the more intellectually inclined madmen under my command, I knew the situation was dire. In the decade since Karamazov's disastrous crusade, the sector had taken blow after blow, leaving its military forces stretched perilously thin. The mining world of desolation had been lost to a Tyranid splinter fleet, which had taken a lot of resources and the intervention of a couple of Astartes chapters to eventually dispatch in a large-scale battle that had left the world of Kefir a desolate husk. And no sooner had that remnant of the Great Devourer been put to rest that the Cold War with the Tau Empire had suddenly turned hot over some insignificant mud ball at the border. While all that meant I could rest easy in the knowledge the Imperium had bigger concerns than Slorkenberg's little rebellion. It also meant that worlds such as Adumbria were left perilously undefended from internal threats like the infected. At the very least, I might be able to get some kudos from the Emperor by cleaning up this mess and preventing his people from being wiped out on this world. That hope was, of course, somewhat diminished by the circumstances which had led to our presence in the system in the first place. It turned out the slanshy cult which Emilie had led had existed on Slorkenberg for longer than I'd suspected. Graduates of St. Trinia Academy for the Daughters of Gentlefolk had been secretly inducted into worshipping the Dark Prince for years before my arrival, and with how many wealthy individuals had come to enjoy the pleasures of the vacation world, several had managed to leave Slorkenberg behind and spread their heresy to other planets by seducing the right tourist. The late Kyria Sedgwick had been one such individual. From what I understood, she'd been the head of her very own small Slyanishi cult among the local nobility, though she'd mostly contented herself with running a discreet, high-class brothel catering to the appetites of the rich and powerful. She had died when the planetary capital had fallen to the infected, but not before using her psychic abilities to send a message to her old friends on Slorkenberg. Given she'd no astropathic training, according to the records Christabel had inherited from Emily, her gifts had run toward creating illusions instead. I was fairly certain Emily had intervened to make sure the message was received. Between Madame Sedgwick's dying message and the imperial decree of quarantine being picked up by Slorkenberg's witches, I'd been forced to ask the Sentian acolytes to use their divination rituals to figure out what was happening, and more importantly, whether or not it threatened Slorkenberg itself. As it turned out, it very much did. Like I had told Colonel Castine, letting the situation alone would result in Nurgle gaining a foothold in our corner of the galaxy. Given the reasons I had given the plague god to be pissed off at Slorkenberg in general and me in particular, I had reluctantly accepted the fact that acting preemptively was the best move available to me, much as it ran contrary to my base instinct. And now, here I was. With every building in Glacier Peak overcrowded with refugees, we had set up shop outside the settlement, in a prefabricated fort, the Borgs had hastily assembled. I hadn't expected Colonel Castine to insist on joining our war council in person, but she'd come back with Captain Krulled, after spending a good hour arguing with her subordinates and setting things up so that we could start sharing our supplies with Glacier Peak. I'd thought she'd be warier of placing herself in the middle of a bunch of heretics, 
but supposed she wanted to keep an eye on us to make sure we didn't have any nefarious intent for her soldiers and the civilians they protected. Or perhaps she thought that, by handing herself as a potential hostage, she would prevent us from taking someone else. Whichever was true, it was an admirable course of action, and not one I would have ever willingly taken myself. In addition to Castine and myself, Colonel Eigdal was also present, serving as the high commander of the USA forces, calculated only to my own authority, because of course he was. General Marlone had initially wanted to come with the expedition himself, but had taken my attempt to get out of participating in this whole mess by insinuating that some members of the council needed to stay behind in case the worst happened as an order for him to hold the fort in my absence while I went out gallantly saving the day and spread the ideals of liberation. Malone had looked so despondent that he couldn't come with us when he had wished me good fortune as we departed. I'd almost strangled him. Aside from Mygdal, Cristobal was also present at the meeting along with Jafar's subordinate Iago and the Borg's own representative, Baselius Zeta. Unlike most others of his order who had been members of the Mechanicus before the uprising, he showed very little mechanical augmentation. From what I'd been told, he'd personally regrown most of the bits he'd replaced with metal equivalents and grafted them back on. He was Slorkenberg's preeminent Magos biologist and had worked on building the Panacea production facilities both on the planet and aboard the Grace of Emili. Jurgen was already serving recaf to everyone, which even Castine accepted. Not only did she look exhausted, the Imperials' own supplies of the stuff had doubtlessly been stretched thin by the siege. I took my own mug with a nod of thanks, grateful for the beverage's warmth as much as its invigorating taste. Militia was also here, stalking the command center like a great hunting felid. Her armor covered her body completely, which protected her from the cold and also kept Kaysteen from realizing I was consorting with Fal Sinos as well. We were all sitting around an hololithic projector, attended by another Borg, and currently showing a slowly rotating image of a Dumbria. There were a lot of things in orbit, as one might expect from even a minor trading world, even if most of it was debris now. Prior to its last stand, Adumbria's CF couldn't possibly have enforced the quarantine, not with hundreds of merchant ships constantly passing through the system. The moment the plague had become worrying, the merchants had immediately booked it, though I doubted they would be welcome at any imperial port that had received the same astropathic message we had inadvertently received. On our way to Adumbria Prime from the system's Mandeville Point, we had passed the hulks of merchantmen who hadn't been fast enough and ended up blasted to pieces by the ESDF, or which simply hung in the void in ominous silence, their crew having been forced to abandon ship and seek refuge planetside at gunpoint once the situation had become untenable. Naturally, I had already received several requests from the expedition's Borg contingent aboard the derelicts and convert them to the use of the newfangled Slorkenberg navy. I had firmly rejected them. Until the source of the plague was dealt with, we didn't have the resources to spare. Not that I didn't understand where the Borgs were coming from. Even after ten years of build-up, our flotilla was pitifully small. Its icons showed in orbit around the planet, straight above our heads. To my unspoken relief that were was some limit to their ridiculous competence. Not even the Borgs could build the infrastructure required to construct entirely new starships in a mere decade. They had given it their best shot, though, and the Emily's gift now sported a fully functional dockyard adapted from some pre-Imperium human megastructure which had been fused to it at some point in its history. Within that shipyard, the fist of the Liberator which served as Slorkenberg's flagship, had been refitted into a carrier vessel, in addition to the superweapon which had destroyed the Dark Eldar flagship and which had been maintained and overhauled, even though it had never been fired since at my express order. It hosted several squadrons of Slorkenberg's new fighters. The Cane Wing Threat, how I wish the design committee had been able to agree on literally any other name. To the best of my admittedly limited knowledge, the Navy had its own commissars, and I had been trained for the Militarum from the start. The Aeronautica Imperialis relied on a handful of designs, which were cheap, reliable, easy to use, and churned out by the thousands in order to wipe out any enemy air support before the Guard went in to deal with the ground forces. With Slorkenberg's limited industrial base, that option obviously hadn't been available, 
meaning that any clash between the Liberation Council's air forces and the Imperium's was certain to end in the former's inevitable defeat, as long as the Imperial commander wasn't another idiot of Chenkov's and Karamazov's calibre and somehow forgot to bring air support along with their guards. But I hadn't wanted the rest of the Council to realise that, as they might decide to do something stupid in response, like trying to summon daemons and bind them within the frames of aircraft or Emperor knew what else, Instead, I had claimed that, by focusing on quality over quantity, the USA Air Force would be able to take on any number of inferior Imperial aircrafts and commission the Borgs to design the most elite, expensive and complex fighter they could come up. The cane wing was the result of over two years of vigorous debate, prototype building, simulations and more than one fistfight between the experts involved. It used a combination of jet engines and anti-gravity technology to fly in space as well as within a planet's atmosphere at speeds that the human brain simply wasn't designed to comprehend and was equipped with a pair of high-intensity LAS cannons by default though its armament could be changed depending on the mission. I had nearly fainted when I had seen the price tag on the final product, but by then it was too late to turn back and I had decided I might as well double down on the idea and ordered the mass production of the thing in the vague hope that any resources spent on this wouldn't be spent on anything else which might make the USA more dangerous. To my carefully concealed surprise, the test flights back on Slorkenberg had gone admirably well, with the first crop of pilots going through the extensive training process with admirable speed. Despite the selection process the candidates had gone through being as painfully stringent as I could imagine, the importance I'd apparently put on the project had meant there'd been no shortage of volunteers. Their first combat sortie had also been a success, insofar that they hadn't all fallen apart as soon as they had left the decks of the fist and hadn't crashed into anything. But it wasn't as if the infected swarms they'd had helped bomb into oblivion had been much of a threat to them. I expected the next stages of our campaign would be much more of a challenge for them. Apart from the Fist of the Liberator, our expedition flotilla was comprised of a pair of captured troop transports, which were filled to the brim with USA troops and equipment, and the support ship Grace of Amelie. The Grace, which had been in a merchant ship at some point, had been peeled off Emily's gift with great care and refitted to carry all the medical supplies and other sundries which our expedition to Adumbria was likely to need. This included a panacea production facility and the schematics and resources to build new ones which, given the spread of the infection on Adumbria, was going to be very needed. Since we didn't have navigators, every ship housed a coven of, of Tsientian adepts who were linked together by sorcery and a bunch of ansibles. When we'd first entered the warp at Slorkenberg, I'd been terrified we were all going to die, but whether because of the Magi's competence, Emily's protection, or sheer blind luck, our journey to Adumbria had been incredibly smooth. Every ship had made it through more or less in one piece despite it being the first time travelling through the warp for almost every single crew member. With our transport capacity so severely limited, I had made sure every soldier between me and the enemy was as tough as possible, thus almost our entire contingent was made up of USA troopers clad in the most advanced power armour the Borgs were capable of crafting, and while it wasn't Astartes' warplate, I must admit that Tessilon Kappa's heretics had made something really impressive. Along with our new tanks and air support, I was reasonably confident we could handle whatever foulness Nurgle was getting up to here, though I would have much preferred it if I hadn't been the one expected to lead the charge. All right, I began, drawing everyone's attention. Let us begin this war council. Colonel Eigdal, you have the floor. Thank you, my lord. At the moment, based on our OSPEC scans and the intel we've received from our new allies, Yigdal nodded in Kastin's direction. Swarms of infected are moving across the planet in what appear to be patrol patterns. Any settlement unfortunate enough to be in their path are destroyed, and in the case where the inhabitants manage to repel the initial onslaught, more swarms will converge on the location until they are overwhelmed and wiped out. Which means, cut in Basileus, Zeta, that there is a central intelligence directing the infected. Yes, Yigdal nodded patiently. We're still moving our assets from orbit, including the panacea reserves for the local population's use. Excuse me, Castian cut in, but what's this panacea's? 
The Slorkenberg natives glanced at each other for several awkward seconds before I valiantly charged into the breach. The panacea is a healing substance based on ASTA, the Liberation Council recovered years ago, and which has completely eradicated disease from Slorkenberg. With it, any ailment and almost any injury can be healed. Then a sudden sense of dread came over me. Wait, are you telling me you have never heard of it before? No, why should I have? I felt my mouth move, but no words came out. Fortunately, Christabel came to my rescue. Lord Kane handed over the original STC to an Imperial Inquisitor years ago, after she tried and failed to kill him. We thought the technology would have been spread across the entire sector by now. We hoped that would be the case. I hastily interjected. I'm sure there is a reason why that isn't the case yet. I could tell they weren't convinced, so I promptly changed the subject. What about the infected, Magus? I know you haven't had much time to research them, but do you have anything relevant to share with us? We do? Yes, the Borg began. Unfortunately, the Panacea has proven unable to undo the transformation inflicted upon the victims of the plague. From our ongoing analysis, it appears that the contagion is only partially based within the materium, and its immaterial component is what causes the bodily transformation, as well as sustains the resulting creatures, which by all biological laws should simply not what happens when you inject them with panacea anyway? I asked, morbidly curious. The infected struggle for a varying period of time as the plague battles the injection. But in all test cases, the plague eventually wins out. Only when the subject is still in the early stage of the infection, such as the defenders of Glacier Peak, which were bitten or otherwise exposed to the plague, can the panacea deal enough damage to the material component to win this confrontation? So all the infected on this planet are as good as dead already, I asked, seeking confirmation of what I already knew. I'm afraid so, my lord. Well, at least he seemed genuinely sorry about that. Damn it all. I'd already known that, of course. But after seeing the panacea perform so many miracles, a small part of me had dared to hope, though I supposed it would have made things awkward for the 296th and my own forces who had already slain thousands of infected. I took a deep breath. I couldn't save everyone. Not even the Emperor could do that, and telling myself otherwise would only lead to madness. There is another point I think I should mention, said Basileus, Zeta. While its empiric component is clearly rooted in the rotting one's influence, its material elements show extensive signs of genetic engineering. Without going too deep into details, which certainly was one of the major differences between the Borgs and the rest of the Mechanicus, it appears to be capable of self-alteration on an incredible level, changing both itself and its host body in dramatic ways. We noticed, said Castine dryly, almost no two of the infected look exactly the same, though they're all just as ugly. Indeed, however, this implies that the base of the infection was artificially created. Yet there is no record of any facility on Adumbria with the capacity to produce such a biological weapon. You think this was brought from off-world? I guessed. It is possible, he agreed. Another possibility is that such a facility does in fact exist, but was kept off the available records and concealed from our scans. Given the percentage of Adumbria's surface in which conditions hostile to most forms of life are prevalent, Building an isolated laboratory would be practical. Kestine looked horrified at the idea, and I could understand why. The thought that all the horror that had befallen Adumbria might be the result of an imperial research program gone wrong before being twisted to the purposes of a cult of Nurgle was the stuff of nightmares. It was also, as I'd learn later, both close and very far from what had actually happened. We've no time to spend on such theories. I cut in vigorously. Colonel Yigdal, what is your suggested course of action? We need to cut off the head of the beast, declared Colonel Eigdal. Cleansing the planet of the infected would take years, and while I don't doubt the skills of our troops, I fear we would run out of ammo before we were done. As Magos Basileus Zeta pointed out, the movements of the infected indicate the existence of a guiding intelligence, and we know exactly where that intelligence is located. Skitterful, I said gravely to show I was paying attention. Everyone nodded. Exactly confirmed Eigdal. 
He gestured to the Borg tending the projector, and the image zoomed in on the planetary capital, which stood where the shadow belt met the equator. Captain Horatio Bugler managed to cripple the entire Ravagers fleet except for their flagship, explained Castine with barely concealed satisfaction. Our Ospex arrays detected it moving in position above Skitterfall, and then she shrugged. Something happened, that's for sure, but we don't know what. It did a number on the flagship, though our species of it landed all over the region. Skitterfall didn't have any anti-orbital weaponry capable of taking out a battleship like that, said Yigdal, before turning toward Christabel and Diego. I'm guessing sorcery was involved. It seems the most likely answer. Yes, said Harold. Like most of the higher-ranking Jinchian cultists on Slorkenberg, he looked deceptively ordinary, if you ignored the sorcerous runes discreetly woven into his clerical robes. With thick reading glasses and a messy hairline, he was the kind of man you would expect to find working behind a desk in some out-of-the-way office, shuffling data slates and being content with never having to actually talk with people in person. But I knew better than most how deceiving looks could be and Jafar's subordinates were experts of being underestimated. Harold had worked as the personal assistant to one of the most powerful men on Slorkenberg, who, unsurprisingly, had been a distant cousin of the governor before the uprising, effectively running the man's affairs in his stead while the inbred foop indulged in whatever debauchery had most recently caught his fancy. The Aristo hadn't suspected a thing about Harold's true feelings and shifting allegiances until the day of the uprising, when the innocuous-looking bean counter had let a kill team of insurgents into his estate and personally rammed an autoquill into his throat. The warp currents are particularly powerful in this system, owing to its position at the crossing of several warp routes, continued the acolyte of the God of Change, out of the corner of my eye. I noticed that Case Dean looked about as uncomfortable with this talk as I, though I was doing a much better job of hiding it, and they're converging on Skitterfall drawn there by the spiritual weight of the horrors that have taken place there. When the Ravagers moved to attack it, that energy must have been used to launch an entropic curse of incredible potency at their remaining ships, resulting in them falling apart in the void and raining down upon the planet in pieces. I finished, my guts knotting like sanguine LA garlands at the thought of such destructive power. Precisely, replied Harold. Could the enemy use this weapon against us in a ground assault? asked Yigdal, showing the practical turn of mind that had led to his high-ranking position. Harold glanced at Christabel, the two occult experts exchanging a silent conversation before turning back to the rest of us as so. I don't think so, said Harold. There are restrictions to bringing such power into the materium. My guess is that the sorceress attack used the city's existing anti-orbital defenses as a base, and those cannot be brought to bear on the surface, right? Not if Skitterfall followed standard construction schematics. Yes, confirmed Basileus Zeta. Then a mass assault on Skitterfall remains our best move, concluded Yigdal. Colonel Castine, what can you tell us of the conditions in the capital? It's hell, she replied without hesitation. The capital had over a million inhabitants before the plague hit, and most of them are still there. By the time we were forced to abandon it, the infected looked even less human than the ones which attacked Glacier Peak. Oh, brilliant, I thought. My imagination already starting to provide all manners of horrific imagery that I had no doubt would pale in comparison to the real thing. Then we can expect a difficult battle. But I am confident we shall be victorious nonetheless, I half lied. Where in the capital would the center of the infection be located? The governor's palace, replied Cristobal. There are other lesser sites of power, but that is where the bulk of the warp energy is gathering. There is also the symbolism of it to consider. The palace is the center of imperial authority on this world, and defiling it will grant whatever pawn of the rotting one is behind all this great favor with his foul god. There is no doubt that great challenges await, said Harold. The amount of warp energy that has accumulated within the capital is incredible. But with you leading the charge, Lord Liberator, then those responsible for this atrocity have no chance. I chuckled self-effacingly. Well, I suppose I do have some experience in storming gubernatorial palaces in order to expel vile filth from power, though I would argue even the dual bars were not quite as ugly as our current opposition. 
that got a round of sycophantic laughter, during which I desperately searched for a way to get out of this and predictably failed. Technically, I supposed I could just tell them I wouldn't take part in the assault and they would have to follow my orders, but that would absolutely destroy my reputation. And no matter how afraid I was of the Nurglites, I was more afraid of my so-called subordinates. Of course, I had no idea just what awaited me within the fallen city at the time. Had I known the depths of the horror which had taken over Skitterfall, I would have taken the first transport back to the Fist of the Liberator and ran all the way back to Slorkenberg without hesitation. Adrian de Fleurs van Herbia to Ventrius, once a scion of House Ventrius and now undisputed master of Adumbria, in the name of the God of Decay, frowned slightly as he shared the final sights of his faithful as they died in the dark and the cold. Many of the lesser blessed perished every not day, even as more were inducted into the fold. But this had been different. The heretics had come to stop the great work, led by the defiler his dreams had warned him about. And that meant that he had work to do. With a long-suffering sigh, he pulled himself out of his chair, chuckling as he felt several fleshy growths linking him to it pop free as he did so. He walked slowly out of his chambers, his body swollen by the grandfather's blessings. But that didn't concern him. He had never needed to rush anywhere on foot before in his entire life, and that wasn't going to change now. Besides, it gave him time to enjoy the sights of the governor's palace. Since he'd killed its previous occupant and claimed it for himself, the building had changed to reflect the allegiance of its new master. The walls were covered in living flesh, writhing with still-growing muscles and nerve clusters. The same was true of the floor and ceiling, giving the impression of walking through the intestines of some vast and fecund beast. Through the open windows, he saw the perpetual twilight of Skitterfall, tinted through the warp-infused clouds that covered the city. As he knew was what had first drawn the attention of the grandfather on his world. The locked position of the planet, the constant light level which kept the only livable region forever trapped between light and dark, day and night, life and faces human and not, leered from all directions, weeping tears of pus and tainted blood. Sacks filled with amniotic fluid and incubating beasts grew in the old gardens, and the galleries of portraits of Adambria's past governors had become exhibitions of the many, many ways in which Nurgle's displeasure could manifest, as Adrian had taken great pleasure in punishing those of the planet's elite who had wronged him in the past. The servants he passed on his way prostrated themselves before him, unlike the common plebeians who were fit only to be used as vectors to spread the grandfather's gifts. These servants had once been part of Adumbria's noble families. As such, they had been allowed to retain part of their intellectual faculties in order to better serve him. Though Adrian had disposed of their inconvenient free, well, once he had grown tired of hearing them beg him for the release of death. Their bodies, though still altered in reflection of the garden's glory, were still capable of using things like weapons, tools, and doorknob. Slowly, he made his way to the former throne room, where Adumbria's governors had held court for thousands of years. After personally strangling his predecessor there, Adrian had turned the place into Nurgle's preeminent temple on Adumbria. If he was the brain of the great work, then the temple and what laid within was its beating heart. The entrance was guarded by a pair of towering creatures which, at his silent command, pushed the heavy doors open, revealing the temple. Like every time he saw it, Adrian's breath caught in his throat, and not just because of the phlegmin that filled it. Hundreds of host bodies filled the chamber, safe for a single passage leading further in. All of them were linked to each other and the living palace through thick fleshy tendrils, their moans a symphony of despair and suffering which was music to his ears and those of Nurgle. And there, atop the altar which stood at the back of the room, was the blessed spawn, Nurgle's gift, to Adrian and the source of the holy sacrament which had spread through Adumbria. Large tendrils ran down the walls and plunged into it, pulsating with various ichors that were injected into and extracted from the blessed spawn, before being circulated throughout the entire palace and beyond. Though Adrian was the chosen apostle of Nurgle on this world, it was through the holy gifts that brewed within the blessed spawn that all of Adumbria was one. It served as a living cauldron. Its unique biology turned to the service of the grandfather, made to help his bountiful gifts pass from the garden into drab reality. 
As Adrian approached the altar, he saw that within its shell of hardened, translucent biological matter, the blessed spawn had changed form again. Gone were the many scarlet eyes and fanged more. It now appeared to be an ordinary infant, in the last stages of its growth before it was birthed unto the world. Ugh, child, Adrian chuckled as he patted the egg gently, before kneeling before the altar in preparation for the rites he needed to perform. Still you resist, still you refuse the grandfather's embrace. It was understandable, of course. The blessed spawn was exactly that such all AI child, with no knowledge of the universe and its many wonders. Its biology was fighting the gifts of Nurgle even as they grew, multiplied and changed within it. Adrian didn't know what exactly the blessed spawn was. For all the gifts he'd received from his patron, his understanding was still limited, though it grew with every passing moment. Still, he had received an answer of sorts, the last time he'd beseeched Nurgle for knowledge. The blessed spawn, the grandfather had whispered to him, was the last child of Legion Strass. Chapter 16 On Slorkenberg, print sheets and vox casts, which had grown in numbers ever since the uprising and the liberation of speech, had reported on the Adumbrian expedition in detail. There wasn't a soul on Slorkenberg who didn't know about it, and all paid close attention to the news coming from the distant Adumbria system. Through the use of the Ansibles, the people knew exactly what was happening in the Adumbria system in real time. They knew that the expedition fleet had arrived in Adumbria, and that contact had been made with the survivors, those pitiful few who had been abandoned to their deaths by the Callus Imperium. They knew of the horror that had befallen that distant world, though few images were made public to avoid traumatizing the children who had never known the Jilbar's oppression. And they knew, too, that the forces of the USA were mustering for an attack on the heart of this evil, led by the glorious liberator himself. In the last few years, the various faiths which had blossomed after the Ecclesiarchy's violent purge had grown in numbers and influence, the creeds of battle, change and joy had taken many guises, while the cult of the god-emperor had quietly continued, in a more gentle and merciful form than the Ecclesiarchy's tyrants had ever allowed. Even the bringers of renewed greatness had expanded their ranks, welcoming all those who thirsted for knowledge and wanted to put it to the service of the people. For such was the will of the Liberator that all be allowed to pray as they desired, so long as they obeyed the law and didn't try to sow discord on Slorkenberg. These faiths had many differences, but there were traits they all shared. Slorkenberg must stand united to survive and prosper, and none other than the Liberator were fit for the task of leading them into the future. The Imperium was a rotting, shambling parody of the noble institution it had once been, its purpose long since eroded away. And the power of decay, the lord of plagues and despair, was the archony of humanity, spreading misery and suffering to break the species' spirit in order to feed off their despairing acceptance. Some creeds believed these last two were linked, that Nurgle had poisoned the emperor and threw him the imperium. Others thought the emperor had been the greatest human to have ever lived, but had died long ago, and the high lords of terror were keeping up the charade that he still lived in order to keep their positions of power. For some of those who saw change as the cardinal virtue, the imperial treatment of psychers was considered a ploy of decay seeking to keep humanity from evolving into a species capable of fighting it on more equal grounds. Others believed that the three powers which had lent their support to the uprising had, once upon a time, been servants or even part of the god-emperor himself, which struggled against decay in the Immaterium in order to bring the Imperium back to its original self, even as their own champions were cursed by decay and transformed into hollow parodies of themselves. All in all, Slorkenberg's religious landscape was a complex and patchwork thing, but also a pragmatic one helping keep the peace which the Liberator cherished above all else. And now, regardless of their personal beliefs, all prayed for the victory of the USA and the Liberator against the hosts of decay which had seized Adumbria. The nails pound, pound, pound into his skull. He hurts. All four of his limbs are broken in several places. His body is awash with various infections which even his transhuman physiology are struggling to contain. The fever he is running alone would already have killed a mortal man, boiling his brain inside his skull. Several of his organs, already withered by centuries of life in the eye of terror, have been torn out of his open guts. 
Yet these pains are nothing compared to the one inside his head. For the nails pound, pound, pound into his skull. He does not know how long it has been. His helmet's internal display broke down centuries ago, and there is no day or night on this accursed rock. He knows, in some small corner of his mind that hasn't yet been broken by pain, that he should be dead already. He wants to be dead, but he isn't. Something is keeping him alive. Perhaps it is the nails unwilling to release him from his slavery to their hunger for violence. Perhaps it is the very sicknesses running through his flesh, prolonging his agony for the amusement of the Lord of Decay. He does not know. And the nails pound, pound, pound into his skull. He wants to fight, to kill, to die. Anything so long as their pounding finally, finally stopped. This one is still alive. A voice. Human. He does not wonder who they are or what they are doing here. All he can think of in the haze of red blood agony is that he must kill them, spill their blood and take their skulls so that the nails will grant him blessed release. But he cannot move. He groans, more blood pouring out from his mouth and twitches weakly like a fish drowning on land. He hates his weakness, though not as much as he hates the nails. Still the nails pound, pound, pound into his skull. Gods, are those his guts? How long has he been out here? Weak, Sam? How the frack is he still alive, eh? Medic? Give him a panacea injection now, A-A-A-A-M, maximum dosage. Do we know what it does to space marines? No, but it's not like we have a choice. Hurry. Something pricks at the exposed flesh of his neck. It takes several attempts before piercing through the leathery skin. He hears the hissing of something being injected into his bloodstream, and then the pounding stop. There is no blood, no killing, but the pounding has stopped. The pain of the nails is gone, not just held at bay by slaughter. For the first time in a hundred centuries, Hector of the Twelfth Legion falls unconscious with a tranquil smile on his scarred mess of a face. The Lord of War was different from every tank Regina had ever been in during her time in the Imperial Guard. It was far larger than the other tanks of the United Slorkenberg Army, and combined the function of an artillery piece with that of a mobile command centre. Colonel Lygdal, in full armour himself, with a power mace hanging on his back, was focused on the four screens covering one side of the command vehicle, which were showing the picked feed of the flock of servo skulls flying above the battlefield. Unlike the ones Regina was used to, the USA's servo skulls were made of metal rather than bone. The USA's tech priests or borgs, as they were apparently called, didn't use normal ones just like the entire USA didn't use servitors. As someone who had always been uneasy in the presence of the Mechanicus ministers due to the horror stories she'd heard as a child of entire guard regiments being turned into battle servitors after seeking refuge on Mechanicus forge worlds, Regina was forced to admit that she found both of these changes to be welcome ones. The fact that their leader, Basileus Zeta, didn't have any visible augmatics, but also helped take off the edge of the constant fear she'd felt since willingly putting herself in the heretic's midst. Her decision to do so hadn't exactly been popular among her subordinates, but she had to do it. Someone from the 296th had to be involved in this. The regiment's honor demanded no less. It had taken a lot of arguing, but eventually even Sulla had seen reason, or at least had grudgingly bowed to her superior rank. And after some more arguing, they had even accepted Regina's choice not to bring an escort with her because, well, they would hardly have been able to protect her from the USA, so she might as well not risk anyone else's lives. Not that the heretics had shown any sign of intending her harm so far. In fact, they had been remarkably accommodating, and even the common troopers were treating her with the respect they seemed to feel was owed to someone who'd held the line without support for so long. It was certainly different from the other guard regiments she'd met before, who'd treated the 296th as second-class soldiers, either because their primary duties were garrisoning imperial worlds, or, less acceptably, because they were women. Regina forced herself away from this train of thought, and back to the present. With Skitterfall's airspace compromised by warp sorcery, the USA had advanced straight from Glacier Peak aboard a fleet of transports recovered from where the 296th had left them after the evacuation efforts had ended. 
They had been refueled with Prometheum stocks brought from orbit along with the supplies for the civilian population, given a quick look over by the Borgs, and within one day of the USA's arrival they had marched out. Within a day, they'd reached Skitterfall. Adumbria's planetary capital had been about as well fortified as that of most imperial worlds when the infection had struck a large wall had been built around the original settlement, before the city had inevitably grown beyond it. Obviously, the gubernatorial palace was located within the walls, but fortunately, the perimeter had already been breached during the Ravager's ill-fated assault on Skitterfall. The infected had tried to close the breach, but whoever was controlling them clearly had no idea how to build fortifications, and the whole thing had come apart again within a few moments of the U.S. artillery bombardment. Of course, the infected had immediately come pouring out of the breach, just like they'd most likely done during the Ravager's attempt. But so far, the USA was acquitting itself much better against the Horde than the warband whose rotting corpses they were forced to trample as they advanced. Despite the horrific appearance of the foe, it was an awe-inspiring spectacle. The Slorkenberg troopers were far from being the equals of the Space Marines, of course. But Regina imagined this must be not too different from what a massed deployment of Sisters of Battle looked like if they were willing to follow proper tactics and not rush at the enemy with the God Emperor's name on their lips. The vanguard troopers were armed with heavy boarding shields and chainswords, pushing against the infected horde while their comrades opened fire from behind the shield wall. Once the breach into Skitterfall proper was secured, the advance slowed down considerably as the USA forces were funneled into the city's streets. She knew from experience that city fighting was a nightmare, though at least there weren't any civilians left in Skitterfall to worry about. The Lord of War remained near the breach, at the forwarded operation base which had swiftly been constructed there. Given what the servo skulls were seeing, Regina had no intention of getting out of the tank and its recycled air. The city looked nothing like she remembered it, as the corruption which had seized its population seemed to have spread to the very buildings. Skitterfall looked like it had been pulled out of the fever dream of some terminally ill madman. The infected were also not only far more numerous, but stronger as well. According to the witches who were monitoring the battle from orbit, they were drawing strength from the very corruption afflicting the city. Regina wouldn't have thought anyone but a Space Marine task force could have punched its way through the city like the USA was doing, and yet she could see it happening with her own eyes. At the forefront of the USA host was Kane himself. The heretic leader was piloting a dreadnought-sized suit of armor with a heavy bolter mounted in its left forearm and a shard of pure blackness shaped into a sword in its right hand. Regina had no idea what the sword was made of, but it cut through the infected like a plasma cannon through a snowfield. At Kane's side was his bodyguard, or Bloodwood as she was apparently called. Why Kane needed a bodyguard while inside that terrifying war machine Regina didn't know, but given the curves of Militia's body armor, she suspected she'd an idea. They were making good progress through the city when she suddenly noticed something. There, she said, pointing at a screen. These infected are going to catch these soldiers, she gestured at another screen, showing a squad of USA troopers currently engaged with a pack of bestial things which walked on four limbs and had entirely two large jaws from behind. Blood and ashes. You are right, replied the other colonel after a couple of seconds, before immediately shifting his voice to a clip. No nonsense command tone. A squad 97. Fall back two intersections and stop the infected swarm coming from the west. They watched tensely as the troopers fell back and held their ground, preventing this section of the USA advance from becoming bogged down. Thank you, Colonel Castine, Yigdil sighed. I'm afraid I'm still somewhat inexperienced when it comes to large-scale battles like this. Training exercises can only do so much, but that's no excuse. You're welcome, she said reflexively, before suddenly realizing that she'd just provided assistance to enemies of the Golden Throne. Until now, she'd only refrained from attacking them and shared information about the other heretics present on Adambria, but now she'd directly acted to help them. She doubted any Inquisitor would have seen much of a difference, but how easily she'd done so still troubled her. Was this how it started? One small, perfectly reasonable footstep after the other, until you turned you back on him on Earth and start worshipping Damon. And yet, try as she might, she couldn't think of anything else she could have done. 
The only question, she thought, was whether or not this had all been part of Kane's plan all along. It was fortunate that, between the Liberator armor and the suit of power armor I wore inside it, because after what had happened during Corbel's attack, I'd made damn sure I wouldn't be left defenseless if I was forced to abandon the larger suit. No one could see my face. I didn't know what expression exactly I was making now, after the utter terror of the last Toti, however long it had been since the battle had started, but I doubted it, it fit the image of Cain the Liberator. I would really have preferred to be in the command vehicle with Eigdal, but the very existence of the Liberator armor meant I couldn't do it without tanking my ill-gotten reputation for heroically leading from the front, which would be perfectly fine by me, if not for the fact that reputation was part of what kept the rest of the Liberation Council in line. And so here I was once again, throwing myself into mortal peril in order to avoid greater peril later. I was beginning to worry this would be a theme for the rest of my entire miserable life, though I was of course still blissfully ignorant of how worse than even my most pessimistic thoughts the future would be. At least the new and improved battle suit was proving itself worth the exorbitant price tag thus the claws, fangs, and occasional biological projectile weapon the infected were using had done nothing more than scratch the paint and slightly dent the outermost layer of armor so far, while my weapons were cutting them down in droves. With how many enemies we faced, I had discarded the use of the wrist-mounted bolter, which would run out of ammo long before making any significant dent into the enemy numbers, and was instead wielding my new sword two-handed although what I was doing with it was really more akin to butchery than any real swordsmanship. The sword had been another surprise from the Borgs, constructed using some of the tech recovered from the few fragments of the Drokari flagship which had been fished out of Slorkenberg's ocean. As Tessilon Kappa had told me with disturbing enthusiasm, they still had no idea how it worked, but they'd still managed to make something useful out of it. According to Militia, the blade was made of something her people called dark matter, which was so non-indicative as to be completely useless. Granted, the succubus wasn't whatever nightmarish equivalent of a tech priest her kin used, but I had a growing suspicion. The name of the staff had been chosen purely for intimidation value. In what I could only think of as a sign that the god emperor hadn't completely given up on me yet, I'd been able to convince the Borgs not to name the weapon the cane blade or something equally asinine. Admittedly, Liberation's Edge wasn't much better, but at least my name wasn't in it, and from a purely martial perspective, I couldn't deny its efficiency. It seemed there was nothing it couldn't cut through, and I didn't feel any resistance through the armor's feedback mechanism. Meanwhile, Jurgen was carrying a multi-barreled Lascanon with an ease made possible only by his own standard suit of power armor and swept entire streets clean with overwhelming firepower while keeping his psychic faculties in reserve for later. Despite being far smaller than the Liberator armor, he was keeping up without issue, as were the other vanguard troopers which followed in my wake. As for Melissa, she was clearly having the time of her life butchering a wide variety of enemies who couldn't so much as scratch her. It was fortunate her laughter could only be heard over the private vox link between her, Jurgen and I, because even the most battle-hardened troopers would have been disturbed by the sheer cruel delight the Exenus killer was taking in the whole thing. Her new suit of armor had been assembled from pieces taken from the corpses of her dead allies. I hadn't needed to be a mind reader to know what her response to being offered a suit of armor built by human hands would be, although the frankly ridiculously impractical spikes and unnecessary edges had been smoothed off. Most of the troopers around me had trained in the claustrophobic labyrinth of Emily's gift as part of the cleansing operation, while none of them had encountered anything as dangerous as the genus stealers I'd stumbled upon during my first and only expedition on that giant death trap. There had been plenty of warped, misshapen things left aboard for them to sharpen their skills on. These lessons served them well now, in the brutal butchery that was battle against the infected hordes in the streets of Skitterfall. Of course, I thought, bitterly, if the infected had possessed half the tactical sense of a Gretchen, we would all be dead already. Skitterfall's twisted streets made it the perfect ground to stage an ambush intensive defense in depth and my paranoid mind kept screaming at me about threats in the shadows that thankfully never materialized. Instead, the infected were apparently content to simply hurl themselves at our ranks enslavering swarms to be cut down by our concentrated firepower. 
Not that we were getting it all our way, of course. As every Imperial Guard commander well knows, quantity has a quality all its own, and the infected present in the capital outnumbered us massively. Yet even so, USA casualties were low. The presence of Medicaid and power armor carrying panacea injectors meant that, even when a trooper fell, they survived more often than not to be carried back to the fob. I had even been forced to make it clear that no, the wounded weren't allowed to return to the fray once they'd recovered, as with their armored suits broken they would be liabilities. Here I was, desperately looking for a way out, and these morons wanted nothing more than to get back to fighting the infected horde. Onward, my comrades, ass, I bellowed over my armor's vox speakers, raising liberation's edge high. Let us bring dawn to this city of eternal twilight. Throne. I couldn't believe I had just said that. I sounded like a character in a two-credits novel. The troopers around me lapped it up, though too high on bloodlust to care about the losses they had already suffered or the fact that we still faced an entire city full of more monsters like the ones we had faced and roared their approval with enough strength to shake the poisoned sky. As far as I could tell, despite all the horrors we'd faced, not a single trooper had so much as taken a backward step without being ordered to. Fracking Cornates Still, we were making good progress, of course. Every meter of advance meant we were closer to the gubernatorial palace and the not-so-fresh horrors awaiting us within, and try as I might, I couldn't think of a way to avoid leading the charge into the den of the beast. My plan, if it could be called such, was to have Jurgen engage the sorceress leader of the infected in psychic combat. I was well aware that for all his psychic might, my aid wasn't nearly as powerful as whatever was responsible for Adumbria's woes, but I didn't expect him to win, merely to draw its attention for an instant. Then, me and every trooper I could bring with me would shoot the sorcerer while it was distracted, and hopefully our combined firepower would be enough to overwhelm whatever defences it could maintain while engaged with Jurgen. It wouldn't be the epic, one-on-one -on -one duel between myself and the source of all of Adumbria's evils, I'd no doubt the rest of the USA fondly imagined was going to happen, but it should work, and more importantly, it should keep me alive. I was confident I could spin it as me not wanting to give the wretched Nurglight the honor of fighting me directly afterwards. I had half managed to convince myself this all would work out when our advance suddenly stopped. What the freak is this? I asked eloquently, looking at the barrier which blocked our progress. It was to an energy shield as the rest of Skitterfall was to a normal city. It looked like a giant bubble of pus that covered a good quarter of the city, including our destination, and absorbed all of our fire without any sign of damage. I had ordered one of the server skulls to fly through, and after seeing what had happened to the unfortunate device, I wasn't going to let anyone try to get through themselves. This appears to be a sorcerous barrier, cut in Harold after some time. The Tessentian Magus was back aboard the Fist of the Liberator alongside Christabel, neither of them being suited for this kind of operation. Fortunately, I believe we have managed to track down its source, sending the coordinates now. The map on my display updated itself to show the location Harold was talking about, and a sudden thought intruded upon me. Wait, I asked, are you telling me that the source of this barrier is outside the barrier itself? Yes, Lord. I waited, but he didn't elaborate further, pushing me to eventually ask, Is there any reason for that? It strikes me as very poor design. Usually, shield generators are located inside the shields themselves. Aye, oh. Harold genuinely sounded taken aback, having clearly been too caught up in locating the source of the obstacle to think about this. I don't know. Maybe the source of the barrier can't be moved. There might be some ritual component to the ritual maintaining it, which is fixed in place. Maybe, I said. Not believing it was that simple for a moment. But we are going to treat this as a trap regardless, which predictably turned out to be the correct course of action, although frankly speaking the trap in question wasn't much to worry about, which was a pleasant surprise for once. According to the old maps provided by the 296th, our target had at one point been a monastery of the Order of the Imperial Light, a local offshoot of the Ecclesiarchy. If the maps were still accurate, which, given how saturated the city was with warp energy, was far from guaranteed, then the temple had been thoroughly desecrated. Statues which I assumed had depicted saints and famous Adam Bryan religious figures had been disfigured, 
and were covered by the same fleshy growth that spread throughout Skitterfall like unholy ivy. Fist-sized insects swarmed on the ground, forming a shifting carpet of nauseating colors and forcing even my power-armored companions to check their footing the Liberator armor, of course, crushed them without slowing down. The temple was defended by larger infected than we'd encountered previously, including a towering brute the size of an imperial knight, which nonetheless went down remarkably easily once 200 USEO troopers focused their fire on its ridiculously small head. Inside the temple itself, we found the source of the barrier atop, what must have been the main altar where the monks had gathered for their daily prayers. It was, or had been, a man laying on the altar with numerous tendrils plunging into his flesh and linking him to the rest of this place's foulness. Despite the utter ruination of his flesh, his eyes were still intact, and he stared at us with agonizing clarity. A quick look was enough to know there was nothing we could do for him. His suffering was fueling the sorcerous barrier. According to Cristobal and Harold, he'd likely been one of the Ecclesiarchy's representatives on Adumbria, chosen for this awful fate because of this. And while the Ecclesiarchy was far from popular among the troopers of the USA, nobody deserved such a gruesome fate. I struck the killing blow myself before ordering the troopers carrying flamers to burn the remains to ashes. To my own surprise, I caught myself muttering a prayer for the poor bastard's soul, though I doubted he'd have appreciated it, given who was likely to listen to me these days. I was about to give the order to move out when I heard a voice calling out my name. Siafaskane, it said. We meet at last. The voice was at once whiny and filled to the brim with arrogance, and I found myself unpleasantly reminded of Cesario V. Giorba's rantings before I had shot him with his own bolt pistol. I turned toward the source of the sound and found that the large mirror hanging on the wall behind the broken altar had become a window into another, even more awful place. The fleshy growths were even more prevalent wherever this was, but I didn't have time to inspect the other room in detail as my attention was immediately drawn to the speaker, who stood right in front of whatever fell pick-taker equivalent he was using for this sorcerous communication. The man, at least I assumed it was a man, was morbidly obese, to a point that made the Giorbes look like paragons of fitness and health. It was difficult to judge heights from within the Liberator armor, but I was confident he was of rather small stature, and wearing what looked like a nobleman's robes, except far too small to properly cover his repugnant bulk. Every trooper in the room aimed their weapon at the mirror, but I stopped them with a gesture. If this was what I thought it was, then this may be an opportunity to gain some useful intelligence. You have me at a disadvantage, sir, I said, to break the awkward silence that had descended on the room. I felt a slight headache start to bloom inside my skull, and reflexively Blink clicked a rune on my armor's internal display, which triggered the injection of a slow trickle of panacea into my bloodstream. The headache receded at once, leaving me free to focus on the conversation. I am Adrian D. Flores van Herbieter Ventris, he pompously announced. He Never heard of you. I replied truthfully, and under its many layers of fat, his face looked like he'd swallowed a lemon. Of course you haven't, you foul heretic. He spat. Your ignorance is made clear by your choice of patrons. Is this what this is about? My stomach plummeted in my boots at the sheer hatred dripping from his every word. But, conscious of the many eyes watching me, I forced myself to keep up the liberator persona, shouting at me for refusing to let the literal lord of decay and sickness torment my people. I wanted to see you for myself, he replied to see the fool who dared to deny the grandfather's gifts and scream his pitiful defiance into the aether for all to hear. I spread out the Liberator Armor's arms. Well, you've seen me now, and I have seen you too, I must say, I continued, layering my next words with all the mockery I could muster. I'm not impressed either. Your flesh will rot on your bones. He spat the words along with a wad of theme that would have made any cleaner weep. Your armor and weapons will rust into nothing, and as your mind breaks under the realization of your own stupidity, you will beg for the grandfather's forgiveness. No, I said, and for once I wasn't lying. I will never beg Nurgle for anything. At last, the entropic energies of the windbag's communication spell became too much for the mirror's fixings, and it crashed onto the floor with a sound between breaking glass and the shrieking of damned souls sending razor-sharp shards flying. 
none of which managed to penetrate my armor. Well, that was an unpleasant conversation, I said, turning to my companions, who were all staring at me. Right, they'd just seen me waste time talking with the madman apparently responsible for the horror surrounding us. But at least now we know the name of our enemy. Let's get back to killing him, shall we? How, how had he done this? The entire time they'd been talking, Adrian had been casting a curse on Cain through the mirror, one that should have had his body shrivel and die under the strain of a hundred different plagues. The curse's power had been diminished by the wards placed on his armor by the disciples of the changing god. Yes, but what remained should have been more than enough to kill him. And yet he hadn't even appeared to notice. Clearly Adrian had underestimated him despite the warnings he had received. One of the other dark gods must have protected him somehow, either by strengthening his body or simply blocking the curse completely he didn't know. No, no, he wouldn't fail. Not now, not when Adumbria was so close to being fully within his grasp. He still had one last card to play. Grandfather Nurgle wouldn't abandon him. He wanted Cain dead. Adrian knew this, and if the thralls couldn't do the job, then he just had to ask for something which could... As he slowly waddled his way back to the chamber of the Blessed Spawn, he ran through the formulas and unwords that had been revealed to him since his illumination into the entropic ways of the universe. Perhaps, if he could break through the Blessed Spawn's resistance, no, that wouldn't work. Oh, the Spawn would be more than able to defeat Cain and his minions, but breaking its defiance would take too long. Then, then he would call for one of Grandfather's strongest children. The entire city had been made as close to the garden as possible. The barrier between realms was thin enough for one of them to cross the gap and join him in defense of all he'd built. Cain was strong, and so were his allies, but they were still only mortals, even the disgusting Xeos scum he'd welcomed in his court. Let them try to use their pretty guns against one of Grandfather's greatest servants. All of their weapons and armor would turn to dust, along with their foolish hope. Chapter 18 Victory. To the USA troopers defending their foothold in Skitterfall against the hordes of the infected and the daemons, victory came when the plague-ridden flesh of the city's inhabitants faltered and failed, crumbling down on the ground. As the Vox network returned to functionality, they heard of the Liberator's triumph in the palace and roared their praises of Cain to the clearing skies. Among them, the Ravager Hector, covered from head to toe in infected guts, lowered his weapons and laughed with delirious joy as the realization fully hit him that the battle was over and the nails still weren't biting. To the daughters of Valhalla, who had held the line at Glacier Peak against the infected hordes for months, victory came when Colonel Custine voxed them and, after a series of code words were exchanged to confirm her identity, and that she wasn't under duress, told them the source of the evil besetting Adumbria had been destroyed. Within minutes, the news spread to the civilians who wept and gave prayers of thanks to the God Emperor for their deliverance. Those who were more aware of where their salvation had truly come were more circumspect, worrying about the future, even as they too cheered for the source of the infection's defeat. To the people of Slorkenberg, victory came when the image of the Liberator emerging from the crumbling lair of his foes, holding in his arms the child he'd rescued from that den of evil, reached them through the Ansible. Within hours, that image was put on every screen and print sheet on the planet, along with numerous stories of the USR's brave efforts in Skitterform. Celebrations of thanksgiving to the powers took place across the planet, and preparations immediately began for a proper triumph upon the Liberator's return. And within the halls of the Liberation Palace, work continued apace to make sure the wheels of government continued to turn smoothly, while Tessilon Kappa gave the order to begin building a new Liberator armor to replace the one lost in battle at once. This was the first off-world victory of the Liberation Council, and all vowed that it would not be the last. For under the leadership of Kane, the banner of liberation would spread across the stars. As she slowly returned to consciousness, the first thing Regina became aware of was the pounding headache in her skull. The second was the feeling of the silky sheets around her body and the comfy mattress underneath it. She blinked, trying to force herself awake, and took stock of her surroundings. She was laying on a large bed in a room whose lavish furnishing couldn't completely hide the metal walls, ceiling and floor, nor could the thick carpet mute the distant sounds of an engine. 
which Regina recognized as signs that she was on a ship. Now she remembered. After their victory at Skitterfall, the USA had begun their withdrawal back to orbit so that the Slorkenberg fleet could bombard the city to destroy any lingering traces of the plague. Regina had accompanied them. Then she had joined in the celebrations taking place all across the ships. A door opened, revealing Cristobal walking in with a glass of water in one hand and a panacea injector in the other, while wearing far less than would have been socially acceptable if there'd been anyone else present. Ah... Now Regina remembered. Well, if she hadn't already been damned in the eyes of the Imperium before, she definitely was now. And the worst part was, she wasn't sure she'd do anything differently if she had the chance to go back. After months of increasingly desperate battles to keep the survivors of Adumbria alive against the infected hordes, she had really needed to de-stress and couldn't help but feel she'd deserved to enjoy the celebrations of the last evening and the night that had followed. She drank the proffered water gratefully before looking at the syringe with an eyebrow raised. She recognized its contents, having seen it used plenty yesterday, but she couldn't think of why Christabel was handing her a pannier injector right now. Really? she asked. For a hangover, isn't that overkill? Christabel shrugged. Rank does have its privileges, but in this instance it has nothing to do with it. You were in a nerglite infected zone just yesterday, and we've enough of the stuff to spare that every soldier who was deployed there is getting a shot today on Kane's orders. Better safe than sorry when it comes to Nurgle's vile tricks, he said. With a grimace, Regina conceded the handmaiden's point and picked up the injector. The design wasn't that different from the stim she'd been taught to use in the guard, and within moments her headache faded away. Despite herself, she couldn't stop a little groan of relief, which made Christabel's smile grow fractionally wider. Thanks. I needed that. Speaking of Kane, where is he? With the fog of alcohol clearing, Regina's memories from the previous night returned, and she fought down a blush. I, huh, I didn't imagine him being here last night, right? Christabel laughed at her embarrassment. No, you didn't, though I definitely see why you'd think he couldn't possibly have been real. What? He sighed dreamily, before becoming serious again. He left us to rest in peace once we were done. Really? That man. He needs to learn to relax more instead of being so focused on his duty. That wasn't how Regina would have described Cain, but she guessed it made sense that Christabel would see him like this. The handmaiden was clearly enamored with the Liberator, and Regina could see why. So, what happens now? she asked. First, we're eating breakfast and cleaning up, replied Christabel matter-of-factly. Then we're returning planet Sai. From what I hear, your regiment is eager to get you back. I was more talking about everything, Regina said weakly. Somehow, her Astra Militarum training hadn't covered this exact scenario. What will happen to Adumbria now? I think that's one of the things CFAS wants to talk about with you today. Even with the infected gone, Adumbria cannot return to the Imperium, and neither can you. You do realize that? I do, sighed Regina. I thought about it, of course. But it wouldn't work. Assuming we managed to even get word to the Imperium, which would be a challenge in itself, they wouldn't believe us. They'd think it a trick to spread the plague. And I can't say I'd blame them, since that's definitely something that bastard Adrian would have done. The thought of that despicable wretch, who had betrayed his entire world to the plague god in exchange for power despite already enjoying the comfy life of an aristocrat, filled Regina with anger and disgust. She'd known that imperial nobles rarely lived up to the standards the god emperor expected of them, but this was a new low. By all accounts, Adumbria's last governor had been more or less competent at his job, or at least had known to leave actually running the planet to the people who were trained for this sort of things while enjoying the perks of his privileged position. When the filth-worshipping heretic had made his move, the governor had been among the first to die. And if, by some miracle, we managed to convince someone important that no, we aren't infected, she continued, then how are we supposed to explain it? Hiding your intervention wouldn't hold up to the slightest amount of scrutiny. And once our collusion with you is revealed, it'll all be over. Part of her wanted to blame Kane for cornering her like this. 
but the simple truth was, they'd all have been walking dead without Slorkenberg's intervention anyway. At least now her regiment and the survivors of Adumbria actually had a future to worry about, which was more than they'd before the USA flotilla had arrived in system. Exactly, nodded Christabel, but you don't need to worry, Regina. Much as we of the Liberation Council don't like the way the Imperium is run, we recognize that there is strength in numbers, and even in its current diminished state, there is much Adumbria can offer us in return for our assistance in recovering. And what's to stop you from taking everything you want and leaving Adumbria to its fate? Other than the strategic importance of this system's position at a warp crossroads, smiled Christabel. Come on now. You know the Liberator wouldn't allow it. The ideals of the Liberation do not allow for slavery, and that is what such a thing would be. Emperor help her, but Regina believed her. After seeing Cain emerge from the collapsing building as the skies cleared of corruption and the infected and their demonic allies fell apart all around them, it was difficult to see him as anything other than a righteous champion of the people. My office aboard the Fist of the Liberator was smaller than the one back on Slorkenberg, but still large enough for my needs, especially when considering how much of a premium space was at on a starship. I had taken refuge aid as soon as my alcohol levels had lowered enough for my survival instincts to kick back into action and scream at me that remaining in the same room as an imperial colonel might not be the best move for my long-term prospect. After a quick nap, a strong cup of recaf and a dose of panacea, I'd thrown myself into work so that I'd have an excuse if Christabel or Regina came by. I blamed Christabel for the whole thing, but at least her involvement should mean Emily wouldn't be angry about it. As for myself, I could hardly complain. Regina was a fierce, red-headed beauty in her own right, in a different way than the handmaid. The time we'd spent together had been very pleasant indeed, and not something I'd ever have considered while so... Fortunately, the after-action reports of the USA deployment at Skitterfall had provided me with plenty of reading material. I'd also taken the time to look at the recording of my confrontation with Guru Greeth, which had been witnessed and recorded by multiple troopers and was already being compiled into an appropriate video for diffusion back on Slorkenberg. Unlike the Imperium, the Liberation Council didn't believe in keeping the existence of Daemon's secret from the population, at least those which weren't aligned with any of the powers currently worshipped on the planet, since seeing a Daemonet would probably put some of the civvies off joining the Handmaiden's latest party. But I'd still put my foot down and demanded that the final product be thoroughly checked for any lingering spiritual influence before public broadcast. I did not want some poor soul to be enslaved by Nurgle as a result of seeing something they weren't meant to and starting a cult to the god of decay right in the middle of Slorkenberg. Since such a group would see my gruesome death as the best way to please their malevolent deity. In the meantime, the recording had helped me clarify just what had happened during the gap in my memories. Guru Gath's voice was full of static on the recording, which made sense given its unnatural source, but the words were still understandable. Inevitables, the bloated thing had said before my freakout. Merely listening to the word sent a shiver of dread down my spine. How violently I had reacted made sense now. That word had haunted my nightmares for years on and off, accompanied by visions of what I feared the path I was forced to walk would lead to, sooner or later. Except whenever that happened... Whenever I woke up in a cold sweat with the sound of my own demented laughter echoing in my skull, I always had to swallow it down along with a bottle or two of Amazek. This time, however, I'd had the perfect outlet for my frustrations in front of me. The whole thing about me threatening Nurgle directly was admittedly a tad more worrying. I could only attribute this utterly uncharacteristic proclamation to my subconscious keeping up the act for the audience of troopers, Jurgen and the militia but it was still a bad sign for my mental health. It had worked out this time, but it all too easily could have ended in my grisly demise. I had to get this under control, but it wasn't as if I could go to a chaplain for help. Huh? There were still followers of the God Emperor on Slorkenberg, weren't there? And maybe being visited by the Liberator to ensure that their freedom of worship wasn't being infringed upon could lead to me speaking with a priest in private. I couldn't really confess the full truth, of course, but maybe talking about the nightmares would help, and the only priests of the Imperial Creed left on Slorkenberg by now were the ones with both an ironclad faith in the throne, and enough good sense and kindness to avoid being purged along with the bulk of the ecclesiarchy. 
so they wouldn't spread what I told them in confidence. It would be risky, but going crazy wouldn't help my survival prospects either. In any case, it was something to consider at length, before making any real decision. Sir, Jurgen called out from outside my office, pulling me out of my musings. There's someone here to see you. Send them in, Jurgen, I replied, knowing that anyone my aide hadn't politely turned away was someone I really ought to meet. Then the door opened, and a two-meters giant covered in scars and a simple white robe entered my office and stopped before my desk. Ah, yes. Somehow, in all of yesterday's excitement, I had completely forgotten about that report I had received while fighting my way through Skitterfall that a surviving Ravager had been found. And due to that lapse, I was now in a room with a cornate transhuman killing machine whose warband had called themselves the Ravagers. Jurgen and Melissa were right here, of course, neither of them having indulged in the celebrations, but I didn't want to bet my life on them being able to react faster than the Ravager could tear my head off. There was a reason Space Marines were the Imperium's greatest warriors, and somehow I doubted falling from the Emperor's grace and embracing Corn had caused the giant's martial prowess to diminish. Which meant that it was time to bluff and pray that for once my fraudulent reputation would actually be worth the trouble it brought. Plastering the best smile I could fake on my face, I stood up and extended my hand to the Chaos Marine. Hello, Sir Hector. How nice to meet you. I lied shamelessly. It was rare for space marines to feel awkward when meeting someone, rarer still when meeting mere mortals. However, having seen the recording of the Liberator facing off against a greater daemon of Nurgle, Hector was certain there was nothing mares about that particular mortal. Unlike the many, many human rebel warlords Hector had encountered before, Cain hadn't succumbed to the madness that affected far too many devotees of the Pantheon. In fact, if he hadn't seen the recording with his own eyes, he'd have thought him an utterly ordinary if comparatively tall male human. The only source of active witchery in the room came from the Liberator's aid, though thankfully the nails were still kept quiescent by his injector collar and didn't bite at a psychos proximity as they usually would. Hector could also, through senses cultivated by an eternity spent in the Eye of Terror, sense the touch of the Dark Prince on the Drukhari Bloodwood who stood next to the desk. Her alien eyes focused on him, her hands casually resting on her weapon. He had fought her kind before, and knew to be wary of her. Part of him wondered if the reason he'd survived so long with his injuries was so that Korn could put him near Cain as a counter to the slain shy branded Cernos. It would explain why the Lord of Skulls hadn't punished him for escaping the nails so far. All right, he could do this. All he needed to do was navigate a conversation without offending his host and benefactor. It should be simple enough. It wasn't as if the last time he'd had a peaceful talk with someone had been thousands of years ago. Oh, wait. Corn, grant me strength. Lord Cain Hector greeted the human warlord with a bow, taking his proffered hand into his own and shaking it carefully. If he accidentally broke it, then he would be lucky to walk out of the room alive and he refused to die in such a stupid way before releasing it. I am Hector of the Twelfth Legion. It is an honor to meet you. The honor is mine, I assure you. I must confess I always wanted to meet a space marine, though this is hardly the way I thought about it happening when I was younger, said Kane with a small but sincere smile. Right. The soldiers he'd spent the last evening socializing with and hadn't that been a strange experience in its own right, had told him Cain had been raised in one of the Imperium's scholar to be a commissar of all things. Given that Hector's only knowledge of the red-sashed officers was seeing them shoot their own men trying to run away from him, he still found it difficult to believe the Liberator had ever been one. You belong to the Ravager's chapter, right? asked Cain. Not exactly, explained Hector. I am a member of the World Eater's Legion. The Ravagers are, were now, Merely the warband to which me and my brothers attached ourselves. It's quite common among the traitor legions. After the heresy, our chain of command won fragmented. Fragmented certainly was a word to describe the utter madness of Scalarthrax and the decades of carnage that had followed as the legion wars raged in the eye of terror. Even the rise of Abaddon at the head of the Black Legion hadn't really ended the internecine slaughter of the traitor legions. It had merely reminded them that they shared a common enemy in the Imperium. Legion? asked Cain, frowning. 
I was under the impression that Space Marines groups were called chap. Right. I forget how much the Imperium hides from its own people. Basically, Iktor then launched into an explanation of the breaking of the Loyalist Space Marine Legions into chapters at Gilliman's orders following the heresy. When he was done, both Kane and his aide were hanging on his every word, clearly fascinated by what? To Hector was merely ancient history, but to them was something straight out of myth. The Exynos, on the other hand, appeared supremely uninterested in the old squabbles of primate. It seems a bit of an overreaction on Gilliman's part, mused Khan, but I suppose I can see where he was coming from. Thank you for explaining, Sir Hector. By the way you speak of it, can I assume you were actually alive during these events? Well, I didn't learn about the Legion's breaking until much later, admitted Hector, but I was alive during the Great Crusade and the Heresy. Yes, there aren't that many of us left these days, especially among the World Eaters, and of course even those remaining aren't exactly great at record-keeping, what with the nails driving us crazy. He gestured to the cables growing out of his skull. Is that what those are called? commented Kane. Apologies, I haven't had the time to read Basileus Veta's report yet. I thought those were simply decorative. Hector chuckled. No offence taken. I understand you must have been busy. I'm not sure what their technical name even is, you'd have to ask an apothecary. Not that there were many of those left in the World Eaters' ranks either, but we always called them the Butcher's Nails. Right now, this collar your tech priests put together for me is injecting me with panacea to keep them quiescent, but without it, they inflict constant, ever-growing pain, and the only way to stop it is through violence. After enough time, they also make it so that violence is the only thing we can enjoy anymore. He breathed in deeply, enjoying the fact that the act wasn't immediately followed by a pang of agony demanding he put the oxygen to use by killing something. It is a relief beyond words to be freed of them, and I am in your debt for this. Hector bowed his head in a show of gratitude. When several seconds passed without acknowledgement, he glanced back up, only to see Cain staring at him with his mouth wide open and a horrified expression on his face. Looking around, he saw Jurgen had the same look. I do, Crenius. Cain took a deep breath. All right, I am calm. Were these things forced upon you by your enemies, or, gods forbid, the Emperor? Aishe. Now Hector understood he had spent so long enduring the nails that somehow he had forgotten there was a very good reason the World Eaters hadn't been the most celebrated of legions even before the rebellion. No, we did it to ourselves, he hastily explained. Our Primarch, Angren, had these implanted in his skull when he was a child before the Emperor found him and reunited him with us. When we saw how they had changed him, we sought to emulate him. But why? Cain nearly shouted, aghast. Why would you do such a thing to yourselves? Wait, I remember hearing that space marines are made from the children of death worlds. Was that already true in your time? Yes, it was. The process of creating an Astartes requires the subject to be young enough to withstand the physical alterations. I am no apothecary, so my knowledge of such things are limited, but I know that attempts to turn adults didn't work out well for anyone involved. They either died horribly, or far worse, they became Corferon. Oh, well that explains everything then, sighed Cain, collapsing into his chair. Of course a bunch of juvies given superhuman strength and made to slaughter the enemies of mankind without adult supervision would make stupid decisions. Hector opened his mouth to protest, then remembered that his entire legion had basically jammed inferior copies of an Archaeotech pain engine into their skulls in the hope that it would make their broken father figure like them, and promptly closed it. Maybe Cain had a point here. How did you even manage between battles? asked Cain. The Ravagers were always on the move from one star system to another. That must have involved months of transit without anyone to fight but each other. It was first blood duels in the fighting pits. Mostly, replied Hector. Then, because he had a feeling lying to Cain, even by omission, wasn't a good idea, he added. But even these only helped so much. There was a lot of, let's say, friendly fire accidents, both with the human members of the Ravagers and among ourselves. You can resist the nails for some time, but sooner or later, the urge becomes too much. There was another moment of awkward silence. Well, Cal rallied, I am glad you are freed from that. And while I hope it doesn't need to be said, 
If you kill someone working for me, I will very cross with you. Unders understood. I promise you that so long as this, Hector tapped his collar, continues to work, there won't be any accidents. And he meant it too. Being freed from the nails wasn't a dream come true, because the nails had taken his dreams from him long ago. But there was precious little he wouldn't do to keep that freedom. He was fortunate that so far, Cain appeared to be more pleasant to work for than the Chaos Lords he was used to dealing with. Not once in the entire conversation had he threatened to cut off the panacea Hector's collar needed, even indirectly. I came here today to express my thanks for your intervention and that of your tech priests. Slowly, Hector knelt, lowering his head in submission. Now that the Ravagers are no more, I would pledge my loyalty to you if you would have me. Aye, sir. Well, this is unexpected, but not unwelcome. I accept your offer in the spirit in which it is given. I'm sure we'll have plenty to discuss in the future. I'm very interested to learn more about the Imperium's distant past. For now, however, please report to the Borgs for a new suit of armor and a set of proper weapons. I doubt it'll be as good as what you're used to, but it's got to be better than nothing. Right. That was another change from his time in the Ravages, or most of his time with the Legion, to be completely honest, that he'd have to get used to. Having a proper logistical branch organization to support the troops, instead of packs raiding for supplies and forced to scavenge their own dead for replacement armor pieces and weapons. The thought of how long it'd been since Hector had been part of a warband with a proper apothecary or tech marine was frankly depressing. As you will, Lord, said Hector, before standing up and departing, relieved that this had gone well. Five days after the cleansing of Skitterfall, the deal between Adumbria and Slorkenberg was formally signed in Glacier Peak, the new planetary capital. I had been there as the Slorkenberg signatory, of course, while Regina Castine was acting as the governor of Adumbria, mostly by virtue of being in command of the largest military force on the planet. To my surprise, she didn't seem angry at me for the events that had happened on the Fist of the Liberator, although I didn't believe Christabel's claims that she was looking forward to a reoccurrence. The population had been all too happy to acclaim Regina as Vice Queen of Adimbria Herold had been the one to suggest the title, both to mark the separation from the old aristocracy and to imply a degree of subservience to Slorkenberg. In a way, the Imperial Colonel had effectively achieved the dream of countless guard commanders before her being made governor of a planet they'd conquered, with their regiment retired from active service to act as their honor guard and enforcers. Sure, Regina didn't have any experience with running a civilian government, but neither had I when the uprising had happened. As I had told her when she'd confessed her doubts to me, her new duties would start relatively small due to how few Adumbrian civilians were left and scale up from there as the planet recovered. And in the meantime, the Liberation Council's bureaucracy would be all too happy to provide assistance. And anyway, she couldn't possibly do a worse job than the Jorbas. The ceremony had been small in scale, due to the fact the planet was still recovering from a Nurglight apocalypse, but based on what I'd seen and what Christabel had reported to me because, of course, she'd already managed to set up networks of informants, I didn't know why I was surprised. The people of Adumbria were genuinely supporting of the Accords. Looking back at the general terms, we had kept things simple to avoid wasting time in pointless minutiae which would probably come back to haunt us at some point. I could well understand, especially since the civvies had no idea they had been rescued from certain doom by a bunch of heretics. The public announcements had been remarkably vague as to our origins, merely naming the Slorkenberg task force as envoys from a non-imperial world, which this far to the galactic east could mean any number of things. The truth would inevitably come out as more people interact as I knew for a fact Christabel was planning to start a branch of the Slayanishi cult on Adumbria, and the Saint-Jans and Borgs would inevitably establish their own local enclaves as part of the treaty. Essentially, Slorkenberg would continue to provide supplies to Adumbria while the planet built back its infrastructure. Fortunately, while its value to the Imperium had laid mostly in its position at a crossing of warp routes, Adumbria could produce its own food and its rotationally locked nature meant that agriculture didn't depend on seasons, though the locals had obviously needed to adapt their practices to this unique environment. A 
set of ansibles would be given to allow communication between the two planets. The technology to produce panacea had already been shared with the locals, with their few remaining tech priests all too willing to pledge themselves to the bringers of renewed greatness if it meant having access to such incredible technology, which, given what their world had just survived, was understandable. Then there was the meat of the deal. The greatest boon for the Liberation Council, and something I could already tell was going to cause me no end of headaches in the future. The hundreds of merchant vessels abandoned in orbit were given unto the Liberation Council to be repaired and refitted as both cargo transport for the future trade between the two systems and much-needed reinforcements for the Slorkenberg fleet. The Borgs were already drawing up plans for orbital shipyards, as well as training centers for the workforce they'd need to recruit from Adumbria itself. By now, there was almost no available manpower left on Slorkenberg itself. That meant that once Adumbria's population recovered, there'd be plenty of work for everyone who might otherwise have been left destitute, since Adumbria's status as a trade world was well and truly fracked. It also meant, to my quiet and unspoken horror, that the Liberation Council would have the means to spread its ideology to other star systems far sooner than the decades I'd expected it to take to build up the required shipyards and starfaring vessels. And with our first expedition being a resounding success, I dreaded to think of how I could convince the Council that no, defeating the rest of the Imperium and the Damocles, Gulf wasn't going to be as easy as taking over a world they'd already given up on. Anyone with any sense would have understood that. But then, if the rest of the Council had any sense, they wouldn't be heretics in the first place. The existence of the Ansibles meant that the Liberation Council would keep in touch with Adumbria's new government in a way the Administratum could only dream of, but the planet would be officially independent, which, given how much its population needed our support, was nothing more than a polite fiction everyone involved had agreed upon. Apparently, the whole thing was already being called the Kanit Protectorate back home, and by that point I'd given up on even trying to change it. My only way out of this mess would involve changing my name, face, and most likely genetic code if I could manage it anyway. The only argument I could think of that might convince the Council to wait before trying to expand this protectorate further was that, if the Administratum had done its job, then every ship in Adumbria was blacklisted from every civilized port in the sector as a potential carrier for the plague which had caused the system to be declared Pedicia in the first place. So unless we were sailing to rescue of a star system in as dire straits as Adumbria had been, any efforts to subvert faithful imperial worlds was doomed to fail. And really, what were the odds of that happening? No sooner had I had that thought that I remembered how dire the Imperium's position in the Damocles gulf had been made by Karamazov's incompetence. Throne knew how many other worlds were in desperate straits and willing to accept any aid, even if it came from heretics like ourselves and having branded this expedition at least partly as an effort to help our beleaguered fellow humans, I had very effectively trapped myself if we ever received word of another star system calling for assistance we were at least theoretically capable of providing. I consoled myself with the knowledge that at least I had prevented the creation of a Nurglite stronghold in the sector, which had been the reason I'd gone on that insanely dangerous expedition in the first place. Regardless of how much trouble this Canite protectorate idea ended up being, not doing anything and allowing Guruoth to claim the planet as a daemon world from which to spread the infection to the rest of the Damocles, Gulf would undoubtedly have been far worse. Besides, the repairs and retrofits of the merchant ships would keep the Borgs happy and occupied for years to come with work that was unlikely to result in reality being sundered by untried technology. And maybe, just maybe, I would get really lucky and one of those expeditions would provide me the opportunity to fake my death and run away from all this madness. The more warp-capable ships were around, the better my odds, after all. All in all, I told myself, this whole Adumbria affair had gone about as well as I could reasonably have expected. To my great relief, Hector had spent most of the last few days talking with Yigdal and training with the USA, apparently. He needed to relearn how to fight properly, without merely following his instincts and forsaking all defense in order to get to the kill and the associated release from his never-ending pain. Faster. I was perfectly fine with him having fun with the USA, since that would keep him far away from me. He'd been far more polite and calm than I'd expected when we'd met, 
but I couldn't get the fact that he and his entire legion had volunteered to get these awful implants into their skulls out of my mind. Seriously, how had anyone ever thought this was a good idea? I could only hope that the Emperor had only learned about this too late to stop it, and that the heresy had erupted before he could do anything about it. As for the girl I'd rescued from Nurgle's altar, she was doing well. We were keeping her in isolation just in case, but Basileus Detta assured me her vital signs were all good. I'd contacted Jafar back on Slorkenberg using the Ansible and told him to see what his mage's divination rituals could figure out about her. By the time those of us not staying in Adambria to help with the reconstruction made it back home, hopefully he'd have some answers. I didn't know much about infant care, but I knew such isolation wasn't a long-term solution for ordinary children. Of course, the girl was obviously not ordinary, though I had no idea just how extraordinary she was at the time. And a good thing too, or the added stress would have made managing the whole diplomatic shindig even more of a nightmare, but the same principle probably applied. The entity that called itself Guru Garth slowly pieced itself back together in the Sea of Souls, the disjointed fragments of warp energy that made up the Baron's infernal consciousness, weaving themselves into something that resembled a mortal soul in the way a virus resembles a healthy cell. Then the mind became aware that it was being restrained. All at once, the pattern's mortal minds forced upon the formless entities of the warp snapped into place, and Garuga found himself wrapped in silver chains their thorns digging into his essence, making him bleed into a bowl of black stone laid beneath his suspended body. Around him were gilded walls covered in sensuous iconography, and the air reeked of perfumes, drugs, and other substances meant to conceal the frailty of flesh and the inevitability of decay. He could hear screams of pain and pleasure, and moans that were not of despair. This was not the garden where he should have arrived following his banishment. This wasn't even the formless wastes, where he would have expected his essence to reform had Grandfather Nurgle decided he needed to be punished for his failure by making the humiliating trek back to the man, which he would have fully deserved. And not only had he failed to kill the faithless Cain, he had also lost the last egg of Legion Strass, which had taken so much effort to recover from the Cacophonus Tower's destruction on Opis. Yes, for losing the last remnant of the Assassinarum's greatest folly, Guru Gurth deserved to spend seven centuries making penance before being allowed back into Grandfather's good graces. But this was not the formless wastes. This was the realm of Slaanesh, and he should not be here. Hello, Guruk, heard a feminine voice that dripped with threat in the Sea of Souls. That was no metaphor. He could see the holes in the floor of calcified elderly souls the drops were creating. He knew the voice's owner before she stepped into view, disgustingly pristine and radiant, the newest daemon princess of Slayanesh, the upstart who had led the legions of excess in capturing the space hulk she delivered to her mortal servant, returning the seventh cursed panacea to the galactic board. Emili, Gurug's youth spat. I should have known. Yes, you really should have. You tried to hurt my beloved, she hissed. You tried to kill him. Worse, you tried to break that which makes him so beautiful and drag him to your level. You are going to pay for that. By all the pustules of Nurgle, she was serious, Guru Xerth realized. This wasn't a game she was playing, nor a long-term scheme to increase her influence in the Materium. She actually genuinely loved that mortal. The Baron always known the Slayanesi were obsessed beyond reason, but never like this. It was one thing to have affection for one's mortal slaves in the same way a mortal might regard a cherished pet. But this, this was madness. Unnatural, foul, abhorrent madness. For all of Cain's insults to decay, this was a blasphemy against the whole of chaos. That none of the other powers seemed to realize that was yet more evidence that Nurgle was the greatest of them all. I will let you go soon. Promised Emeli with a smile that revealed her disgustingly perfect white teeth. My beloved gave you a message for your master, and I don't want to stop you from delivering it. This should not relieve you, however, she whispered. It had not, for Guru Garth was no fool, because it means I will have to work on you intensively to make sure you understand the depths of your folly before I have my servants throw what's left of you into that rotting garden. With grandfather's blessing, I am beyond torment, replied Guru Gith defiantly. Do your worst. Emil smiled, and for the second time the great unclean one felt fear. 
Oh, I will. Chapter 19 Canopolis rejoiced, for the Liberator had returned in triumph. The entire city, it seemed, had come out to meet its victorious heroes. The sidewalks were packed with thousands of civilians who cheered the troopers of the United Slorkenberg Army as they marched past, walking in perfect parade formation. Eight of the Lord of War, greatest of the war machines crafted by the bringers of renewed greatness, sat Cain himself, smiling and waving to the adoring masses. Seeing the Liberator hale and hearty was a relief to all, for though none doubted his martial prowess, the mere idea of losing the one who had delivered them from the Imperium's tyranny was more than they could bear. Next to him, clad in crimson armor and holding a great chain axe, was a veritable giant of a man. According to the rumors which were already spreading through the crowds, he had been found on the doorstep of the evil which had sought to devour Adumbria, wounded to the very edge of death after trying to stop it with his slain comrades. The bringer's ministrations and the wonders of the panacea had then restored him to health just in time for him to fight alongside the USA against the infected. The footage of his prowess had been sent ahead of the fleet which had carried the victorious heroes home, and its popularity was second only to that of the Liberator's own exploits. There had long been stories of the Angels of Death on Slorkenberg. The previous regime hadn't shied from using them as threats, claiming that their fury would descend upon all who dared rebel against the Jorba's divinely appointed rule. In the years since the uprising, however, new legends had begun to circulate, speaking of how some of these angels had turned against the Imperium after seeing its corruption. Now the Liberator had returned from a just and righteous war against the forces of rot and decay with one such angel at his side. Those who followed the warrior creed prevalent in the unified Slorkenberg army recognized the icons of the war god painted on the warrior's armor and rejoiced that such a champion of their patron now stood at the Liberator's side. Today had been declared a public holiday by the Liberation Council so that all but the most vital of workers could go out and celebrate. Over the next few days, the fallen would be buried with all due honors in ceremonies attended by the entire Liberation Council and led by preachers of each of Slorkenberg's major creeds to ensure that their spirits found the peace they deserved. Yes, tomorrow there would be time to mourn, but today Slorkenberg rejoiced. As the sun set over the day of the expedition's triumphant return, Jafar met the Liberator on a small balcony with an unimpeded view of the capital. Khan's aide had already poured a cup of Rika for the chief clerk when he arrived, with precisely the dosage of cream and sugar he preferred, and Militia was also present, of course. But apart from these two, they were alone. While the knowledge Jafar was to deliver would no doubt end up being shared to the rest of the council, for now only those present would know the full picture he'd uncovered. And by all the hidden names of Tsench, what a wondrous and terrible picture it was. So Jafar. Asked Cain, what did you find out? It took a lot of effort and the interrogation of multiple daemons, but we have managed to uncover the child's origins. They are fascinating, to say the least. I honestly believe you should be sitting down for this, Lord Liberator. The Liberator raised an eyebrow, but still sat on one of the comfortable chairs which had been dragged on the balcony. In the great scheme of things, it was a minor thing, but Jafar still appreciated the simple fact that Cain was willing to follow small advice like that. Even after more than a decade, it was a pleasant contrast from the people he'd worked for prior to the uprising. What do you know about the Imperium's assassins? Jafar asked once the Liberator was sat. Oh, I already don't like where this is going, groaned the Liberator. To answer your question, not much. I was taught that they exist are deployed against those who really tick off the High Lords and supposedly never fail. Of course, even back then, I already found that last bit doubtful. An accurate summary allowed Jafar. There had been no reason for the Imperium's slave trainers of the Scholar Progenia to teach him anything more, after all, which is in truth, even our divinations didn't reveal a lox. The whole organization's past and present are protected by anti-scrying wards of incredible potency which couldn't possibly have been created without the efforts of numerous and powerful psychers with extensive training in the arcane arts and access to the kind of occult lore Jafar and his brethren could only dream of. Once again, the Imperium's hypocrisy was all too obvious. That's to be expected, remarked Cain. They wouldn't be able to do their jobs if anyone having access to divination could predict their actions. Indeed. 
Still, while the organization itself is protected, the echoes of its deeds aren't. We did manage to find out that there are different branches of the order, called temples, each specializing in a particular method of elimination, ranging from the undetectable to the very obvious, depending on what best serves the High Lord's interests. These temples have existed since the organization's founding and have killed untold numbers of people in their blind service to the High Lords. Given that the assassins were supposedly bound to the will of the High Lords of Terror, and that presumably those tyrannical monsters had lots of demands on their time, one might have thought the officio would be deployed only rarely. And yet, the sheer amount of bloodshed Jafar's auguries had revealed indicated that either the High Lords were very, very liberal with the use of their hired knives, or the Imperium's ultimate slave masters were far from being the only ones who could afford the officio's services. Jafar wasn't sure which option was worse. That's all very interesting, especially since there's the possibility the Imperium will use them against us at some point. But how does this all relate to the girl? asked the Liberator. Patience, my lord, Jafar jokingly chided. I am getting to it. Over a thousand years ago, a faction within the Assassins sought to create a more efficient method of eliminating their targets. In essence, they sought to create a brand new temple, one whose assassins would be able to kill not just a single individual, but entire groups, despite the fact that any successive kills become more difficult, as the targets are now aware of the assassins' existence. That's not an assassination. That's a purge, Kane pointed out. Don't the High Lords have space marines for that? Jafar shrugged. I am fairly certain there was a certain degree of interbranches rivalry involved in the whole thing, and I am absolutely certain that assassins were deployed against Space Marine commanders in the past. Of course there were, muttered the Liberator, rightfully disgusted by the Imperium's murderous infighting. Continue, please. They called this the Mayorist Temple and poured an obscene amount of resources into making it a reality. They recruited some of the finest genitors of the Adeptus Mechanicus and provided them with genetic material from a variety of species, including obscure Essenos breeds, in order to create a hybrid that would function as a literal living weapon, explained Jafar. The Maroris assassins were meant to be deployed without any equipment, because their own bodies were all the weaponry they needed, and they could assimilate the biomass of their victims to grow more dangerous with every kill. That... That sounds remarkably like the Tyranids' ability to endlessly adapt and create new bioforms from the biomass they devour, Kane frowned. Except you said the temple was created a thousand years ago, and the hive fleets were only discovered in the 700s. I think in this case, the superficial resemblance might genuinely be a coincidence, said Jafar. After all, Lejen Strassi's abilities worked on herself and were nigh instantaneous, which was what made her such a deadly fighter. But I cannot be certain. The Assassinorum was extremely thorough in covering their track. No one outside of their order knew of the project's existence until their first success. A being called Legenstrus escaped her conditioning and broke free. Of course she did, groaned the Liberator. Really, what did these morons think was going to happen? Their hypno-training machines would all have been calibrated for purely human brains, not whatever it was they ended up creating. I imagine that fear of reprisal played a big part in the whole disaster, suggested Jafar. Until Legion Strasse herself, their tech priests wouldn't have had any way of testing whether their undoubtedly customized hypno-training devices could work on the still theoretical Mayoreras assassins. But they might have felt it unsafe to tell that to the official. You're probably right, sighed Kane. Go on, tell me what happened once Legion Strasse broke free though I think I can guess. Indeed, it didn't take someone of the Liberator's intellect to predict how that particular tale ended. She slaughtered her creators and escaped, setting off a chase across the stars that lasted for decades until she was cornered on a remote world named Opie's. There, she bound the local aristocracy into her service, along with numerous powerful servants of the gods, to the point that when the assassins found her again, they had to engineer a full war just to get her experience. And what a war it had been. The powers that had been leashed by the officio and usurped by Legion Strassi had been such that Jafar could only compare them to the Lady Emilie herself, vessels of the gods' blessings whose deeds had shaken the foundations of entire worlds.
The fact that they still hadn't been enough was a sobering reminder of the terrifying potency that the Imperium, for all its crippling flaws, yet possessed. In the end, Ligian Strauss was killed by the Imperial Fists, though not without exacting a fearsome tally. All the daemons with which we communed believed that her progeny had perished with her, but when you defeated Garug Arth and freed the child from Nurgle, she was revealed to them as being the last of them, salvaged from her mother's defeat at the last moment and kept hidden from all until she was brought back to the Materium on a Dumbria, where her unique biology was used by that thrice-damned bastard Adrian to create the plague, finished Cain. That explains what Basilia Seta found when studying it. Exactly. The plague could endlessly adapt and reshape the flesh of its host, just like Legien Strasse could reshape her own biomass in whatever way she desired. Of course, like everything touched by decay, that ability was only a pitiful shadow of the original. There was a moment of silence as the Liberator considered what Jafar had just revealed to him. The follower of Tsienge couldn't help but feel excited, wondering what decision Kane would make. It was always a joy to see such a master schemer at work. You will not spread this information to anyone, Kane said at last. The Protectorate cannot handle the Assassinorum coming after us to hide their past mistakes at this time. I trust you to use whatever means required to ensure the silence of your people without taking it too far. It made perfect sense. Given what Jafar had learned of the Opis campaign, it was obvious the assassins had no sense of restraint whatsoever when it came to keeping their failures from being revealed. And what of the child herself? The assassins made the same mistake with Legion Strass the Scholar made with me, mused Kane. They assumed that their brainwashing methods would be enough to control her, because those methods worked on them. It is really quite horrifying, don't you think? Brainwashed agents taking orders from brainwashed superiors and taking murderers to be brainwashed into more effective murderers, all following precepts that were written 10,000 years ago, with gods know what mistakes and glitches slipped in over the centuries. Jafar shivered at hearing it put so plainly. The Liberator, as always, was correct. The Officio Assassinorum was a grotesque instrument of tyranny, made up and maintained by slaves too broken to even realize they were slaves. Without free will, without the ability to think for themselves and argue with one another, it was all too easy to imagine how the Mayorus project had been allowed to proceed despite the many, many flaws in its very premise. In any sane organization, the idea would never have made it past the drawing board, if even that. But in the officio, there had been nothing to hold it back, nobody with the wit to stand up to their superiors and point out how monumentally stupid and dangerous the whole thing was. However, the girl is innocent of any of that, continued Cain, and I will not blame her for the sins of her mother or those of her mother's creators. Even so, she is no ordinary child, Jafar pointed out. I do not know how much of Legendrasse's abilities she inherited or how her time in Nurgle's captivity and subsequent exposure to the panacea affected what she did inherit, but that much is obvious. Then it is fortunate there are so many extraordinary people on Slorkenberg who can help her grow up as a stable and happy individual, replied the Liberator with a small smile, before turning away to look at the sunset. Legin Strassi turned on her makers because she wanted to be free instead of being used as a weapon. We will give her daughter that freedom, just as we give it to all those under the banner of liberation, and she will make a powerful ally. Once she grows up, mused Jafar, before freezing where he stood. The Liberator was glaring at him. His face was pale with fury, and his eyes cold as death. Not since the days of the uprising, when Cain had emerged from the transport bringing him back from his confrontation with Ciziovi Gioba, had Jafar seen the Liberator like this. She will be whatever she wishes to be, Cain growled between gritted teeth and nothing else. There will be no pressuring her, no manipulating her, no indoctrinating her into thinking her powers, whatever they are, are the only thing of value about her. Am I understood, Jafar? Yes, Jafar squeaked, painfully aware of Jurgen and Melissa staring at him too, and of how none of his sorcerous protections would protect him from either of them for long. Yes, my lord, a thousand apologies. I spoke without thinking. Yes, you did. The Liberator cut him off. We will not speak of this again. Now go. I will see you tomorrow at the funeral. His heart pummeling in his chest. 
Jafar bowed and beat a hasty retreat, only realizing he had brought his recaf cup with him once he was halfway across the palace. Deciding it might help calm his nerves, he raised it with trembling fingers and drank. He knew where he'd misstepped, of course. Looking back, it was obvious. Of course, Kane wouldn't agree with anything that even remotely resembled his own treatment by the Imperium. How stupid of Jafar to forget. He'd have to remember that in the future, because while Khan was willing to tolerate a lot from his subordinates, clearly Jafar had found the line that, if crossed, would finally make him turn his prodigious power on them. It had been a long day. After riding through the streets smiling and waving at everyone, I'd been forced to make another bloody speech. Although by now I had enough experience, it had gone like a charm. I had rambled about the duty we all had to assist our fellow humans who had been abandoned by the cruel and callous Imperium, about the threat of decay and its servants, and the valor displayed by the USA in those who had made the ultimate sacrifice. I had pointedly not mentioned my own against Guruk, both because I still felt uncomfortable thinking about it, and because I knew appearing to downplay my own achievements would only increase my undeserved reputation for leading from the front and taking on the greatest challenges even more. The plebs and soldiers alike had lapped it up. I would probably have to give another one tomorrow at the ceremony in honor of those who, despite the power armor and panacea, had died in the cleansing of Skitterfall. The USA total casualties for the deployment were a frankly absurdly low number, given the opposition we had faced, but I knew that would mean little to their families and friends, and appearing not to care about them could plant seeds of resentment that could, in time, blossom into attempts to kill the one they thought was responsible and since I was the one with my face on the pick screens the most often. It would probably be me. All in all, I had already been feeling tired when Jafar had dropped his findings on me with all the subtlety of an artillery shell. So, after Jafar left, I finished my recaf and returned to my quarters, where I promptly collapsed on my bed. Between Hector's history lessons and this, the more I learned about the Imperium's past, the more it seemed the whole thing was trying to self-destruct in the most spectacular way possible. What the freak had the assassins been thinking? I had no choice but to hope what I had told Jafar would turn out to be true and make damn sure that the biological abomination I had brought back to Slorkenberg didn't have any reason to hate me when she grew up. Considering what Jafar had said at the end of our exchange, it was clear that I'd have to raise her myself. I couldn't trust anyone on this whole planet to do it in a way that wouldn't create a threat to the Imperium. And, more immediately concerning, to everyone living on Slorkenberg, me included, that surpassed my worst nightmares. It did mean I would spend time near someone who could kill me instantly any time she so decided, but really, what was one more at that point? I would make the announcement the day after the funerals, the images of me emerging from the crumbling gubernatorial palace with her in my arms had already spread across Slorkenberg, but I'd ordered everyone involved in watching over her to stay silent until I learned what the Tsayentians had found out. I could honestly say that we'd found her at the heart of the Nurg-like corruption on Adumbria, a baby used by the servants of decay to fuel their vile works, and whom we'd saved using the panacea. A miracle child, rescued from the very pit of hell and given a new chance at life. As I dwelled on that thought with morbid amusement, I was struck by the realization that I needed to come up with a name for the girl too, if I didn't want her to think she was being treated as a tool or a weapon. She couldn't just be called Legionstrus. That was guaranteed to bring the assassins to my doorstep with pointed words and pointier blades. After spending entirely too much time thinking about it and browsing several tomes from my suite's bookshelves, which, considering what I knew of its previous occupants, likely hadn't been read in generations, Despite the absence of dust which spoke to the cleaner's diligence, I finally decided the daughter of Ligienstrasse, first and last member of the Mayris Temple, would be called Zerayakain. The retribution class, battleship throne, eternal hung in orbit above Coronus. For all its majesty, the scars of the recent battle, it had fought against the hive fleet were all too visible. Entire decks had been abandoned due to the damage the Xenos bioships had inflicted. Through the observation window, Inquisitor Amberly Vale most would call her Lady Inquisitor these days, but she still thought of herself as simply another Inquisitor, 
could glimpse the rest of the fleet, which had barely managed to save the world of Corania from the maw of the Great Devourer. There were over two scores of navy vessels, along with strike cruisers belonging to the Bone Knives and Reclaimers Astartes chapters and a small flotilla of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The victory at Corania had been hard fought. What had begun as a mere clean-up of a Genestela cult, for which the gathered strength of the Panacea Cabal had been ludicrous overkill, had become a desperate battle for survival the moment the Hive Fleet had arrived. In the end, it had only been a daring boarding action by the Space Marines which had disturbed the Hive mind long enough for the Imperial forces to gain the upper hand and defeat the main swarms on the planet while the Senos fleet was defeated in the void. Amberley's days of going undercover to expose the Exynos cults seeking to undermine the fabric of the Imperium were well and truly past her at this point. These days, she was forced to delegate such work to her operatives. She missed the thrill of it, but knew that she could best serve the Imperium by making sure the Panacea Sti was spread across as many worlds and used to benefit as many loyal citizens as possible. The Battle of Corania had provided them with the opportunity to test the panacea on individuals infested by the Genestealers, and the results had been very promising. As they'd hoped, the panacea could purge the Exynos taint from implanted individuals, freeing them from the brood mind, although the psychological scars of being violated in such a way remained. However, the panacea could do nothing for the born hybrids, regardless of their generation. According to Margo's Lazarus, the Tyranid genes were part of their natural state of being, so the Panacea merely healed them of any injuries or sickness, like it did for the transhuman space marines. Not that Amberley would ever have compared the Astartes to Genestela hybrids, of course. Lady Inquisitor, a gruff voice called out, They are all ready to meet you. Thank you, Rupert. Major a formerly captain, Rupert Brokelaw was the highest-ranking survivor of the Valhallen 301st, a crack planetary assault unit which had been badly mauled by the Tyranids. Impressed by their bravery and, more importantly, their martial skills, Amberley had decided to recruit the survivors of the regiment directly into her service. She needed additional firepower she could rely upon, and the 301st were fiercely loyal to the Imperium and dedicated to her, since she'd gone personally onto the planet in her suit of power armor, along with the reinforcements which had kept them from being wiped out and devoured by the Tyranid swarm. Given who ran the militarum in the Damocles Gulf these days, she had no doubt she'd get away with it. As Amberley made her way to the meeting room, she found her psyche fidgeting in the corridor clearly waiting for her. What is it, Rachel? she asked gently. The sickness is screaming in pain and fury. She replied with an expression of utmost seriousness on her face. The shadow has defeated it, claimed the abandoned crossroad, and rescued the child of the seventh house. I see, said Amberley, lying through her teeth with practiced ease. Sometimes the psyker's ramblings were understandable, and other times they only made sense much later. This, it seemed, was the latter case. She'd have to see if Mottet could make sense of it once the meeting was over. Go get some rest for now, she told the psyker before walking into the meeting room. There, waiting for her, were Lord General Zyvan, who had settled in as the Supreme Militarum Commander of the Damocles Gulf, Captain Grise of the Reclaimers and Chapter Master Ketep of the Bone Knives Space Marine Chapters, Admiral James D. Flint of Battlefleet Damocles, and Magos Lazurus, representative of the Mechanicus elements which had been informed of the Panacea's existence. The Bone Knives and Reclaimers had been brought into the fold by being given copies of the Panacea ASTC, along with samples of the final product, despite their kind's reluctance for all this cloak-and-dagger business. The decrease in battlefield casualties this had caused had convinced them of the importance of providing this technology to the rest of the Imperium, regardless of what entrenched powers might say. The Reclaimers in particular supported the Cabal's agenda with enthusiasm, both because of their tight bond with the Mechanicus and because of how vital the Panacea had proven to their efforts in the Viridia campaign. The Chapter Master's armor, painted in the same magenta color as all bone knives, had been recently cleaned and polished, but the damage from boarding the Tyranid bioship was still visible. No doubt the chapter's tech marines had been too busy directing the repairs of the ships to have the time to perform more than the most basic maintenance that, 
or Ketip, had deliberately held from removing the traces of battle before this meeting as some kind of power play. Gris' own battle plate, painted in the white and yellow of his brotherhood, was in a similar state, the two of them having fought side by side at the turning point of Corania's defence. Admiral James Steer Flint was considered something of a maverick in battle fleet Damocles, a scion of one of the many families which made up the bulk of the Navy's officer corps. He had spent decades stuck at his current rank due to being absolutely uninterested in playing the games of politics which were required to advance anywhere past a certain rank in any imperial organization. But for all his habit of playing the fool, there was no denying his skill at void warfare. It had been his daring maneuvers at Karania which had given the Space Marines the opportunity to board the Hive ship and then to defeat the Exynos fleet without sacrificing his entire Navy battle group in the process. And the crews of the ships under his command absolutely loved him. A love he either genuinely returned or went to great lengths to appear to Amberley wasn't sure which yet, but she would find out eventually, for curiosity's sake if nothing else. Compared to the Guard and Space Marines, the Navy had comparatively less to gain from the generalization of panacea use, but lesses didn't mean nuns. Far from it. Life aboard a starship was dangerous at the best of time, let alone during battle, and thousands of injured crewmen had been saved and returned to their duties, thanks to the panacea following the void battle of Corania, since there was no way of hiding how this medical miracle had happened. Amberley had decided she might as well bring Flint on board. The Admiral had been utterly delighted to be made part of the Panacea conspiracy. Partly, Amberley suspected, because he enjoyed the excitement and intrigue of it. It would have been easier to have this meeting by Hololith, but also easier for it to be intercepted by hostile parties. This room, randomly selected among those available aboard the throne Eternal, was as secure as they were going to get. Gentlemen, Amberley said as she took her seat. As the founder and nominal head of the Panacea Cabal, she sat at the head of the large conference table. Thank you all for being here. Now, let us begin. Admiral, what is the status of the fleet? It needs repairs. A lot of them, replied Flint without hesitation. Half the ships need a complete dry dock and refit before I'd take them anywhere someone might shoot at them, and the rest could do with a few months in the care of the tech priests, but can still sail and fight. Nothing we didn't expect, then, said Amberley. Lord General, what about the situation in the rest of the sector now that our astropaths have recovered from the Tyranide's shadow? The war against the Tau isn't going well. That much hasn't changed, said Zyvan grimly. It's a meat grinder, and one that's taking valuable resources away from other fronts. Gravelak's position at the end of the Imperial supply lines had allowed the Tor to bring their own assets to bear much more easily than they could. The planet itself was little more than a pile of rubble by now, not that it had been worth much to begin with. with the, and while they were busy trying to salvage the situation on that front, the wily Xenos had sent feelers across the entire borders to take advantage of their weakened presence. Unfortunately, they couldn't just let the Tau take Gravelax and the rest of the border systems. In addition to being an affront to the God Emperor, it would leave the rest of the Imperial territories in this galactic region unacceptably exposed. I have had our diplomatic corp reach out to the Tau Empire and explain that the whole Gravelax debacle was the result of a Genestiel occult's plot, but without success, said Amberley. The Tau have had little experience with such infiltrations themselves, and they think we're lying to cover up the fact it was one of our governors who shot their ambassador and started this mess. Which, to be fair, was absolutely the kind of thing the Imperium would have claimed in an attempt to manipulate the ignorant newcomers to the galactic scene. It was just that, in this particular instance, that was the actual truth. If that traitorous... Xenos touched bastard Grice hadn't died long ago during the purges, which had followed one of the Imperium's short-lived recaptures of Gravelax. Amberley would have gleefully executed him herself. Even if they believed us, it would change nothing, said Grice. The Exynos are notorious opportunists. The Gravelax incident merely gave them the justification they were looking for to invade without seeming to be the aggressors in order for their propaganda to sway the weak-minded among the population of the worlds they steal from. You're right, Captain, sighed the Inquisitor. We'll just have to tough it out and hope the tail run out of steam before they do too much damage. 
That the Imperium could outlast the upstart Xenos wasn't in question. They had their own informants within the Tiwa Empire. Their very philosophies made them worryingly easy to infiltrate, and knew that for all their advanced techno-sorcery, the Tau was still only a minor power in the grand scheme of things, contained to a fraction of the eastern fringe, whereas the master of mankind's dominion stretched across the galaxy entire. In other news, she continued, I have received astropathic word from my operatives on Perimunda. With the help of Captain Gree's battle brothers, they managed to locate Killian's lab and destroy it. It turned out he was taking refuge inside a sororitas convent of all lying to them about the nature of his work. Unfortunately, she grimaced. While they got Matthias, Killian himself managed to escape with the artifact. That is unfortunate, said Zivan. Do we know what exactly that renegade was working on, at least? Most of Matthias's research was destroyed alongside the Heretech himself, buzzed Lazarus who had received the same reports he had through his own agents within the investigation team. We do know, however, that it involved working with a small local chaos cult. Oh, brilliant, groaned the Lord General. Do you think he'll make a run for Slorkenberg? It is possible, admitted Amberley although she had trouble imagining Kane entertaining the mad delusions of a radical like Killian for long. Besides, Killian's particular brand of insanity was all about using any means necessary to destroy all followers of chaos, and she could only hope Killian wasn't so far gone he'd hand over whatever it was he and Matthias had been working on to someone as dangerous as the Liberator. I'm sorry to interrupt, asked Admiral Flint, but who are you talking about? Right, he hadn't been part of the cabal when she'd explained this before. Amberley gave the Admiral a brief summary, editing all the bits Flint didn't need to know without even needing to think about it. Years ago, Amberley was enjoying the dubious hospitality of Archon Vilehart, in fact. A joint research facility of the Ordo Xenos and the Mechanicus on Perlia had been ransacked, its entire crew slaughtered and the invaluable artifacts being studied there stolen. It had taken years of investigation by her operatives while she was busy with trying to bring the wonders of the panacea to the Imperium, but eventually she had figured out what had happened. Methias, one of the tech priests working in the facility, had gone mad after spending too much time working on unraveling the secrets of ancient genotech, an all-too-frequent professional hazard and contacted one of Amberley's less-than-sane peers, also an all-too-frequent professional hazard, in order to pursue his own radical interpretation of the artifact's possible uses. Ernst Stavros Killian, the member of the Ordo Hereticus in question, had tried to get the project passed under his control, and when the rest of the Damocles conclave had rejected his request, decided that the only logical course of action left was to have over a hundred faithful servants of the Golden Throne brutally murdered in order to steal the artifact. How he had thought nobody would suspect him was, frankly, beyond Amberley's understanding. The Damocles Conclave had immediately summoned him, and when he'd failed to respond, branded him excommunicate Diabolus. Because Amberley was still a member of the Ordo Xenos, who had initially sponsored the research on Perlia, and one of the most junior inquisitors in the sector. She had been saddled with the task of finding the renegade and bringing him to justice, since she didn't want her peers to realize how busy she was with the panacea just yet. She'd had no choice but to graciously accept this honor. Fortunately, her growing network of allies had given her more options on how to hunt Killian down, as well as the ability to call on a couple squads of space marines when her acolytes had finally found him. And a good thing too, because if not for the presence of the reclaimers to awe the sisters of battle enough, for them to realize they had been deceived and used by a renegade, things would undoubtedly have turned ugly. As it was, the sisters of the Order of the White Rose on Perimunda had needed to be talked out of committing ritual suicide to atone for their unwitting participation in Killian's scheme. I see, said Flint once Amberley was done bringing him up to speed. This is, I confess, I had no idea the Inquisition was so fractious. That's very much on purpose, replied Amberley. Keeping up the pretense of unity is more or less the only thing everyone agrees upon since showing the cracks supposedly weakens the authority of the whole thing. Then why tell us this? asked the Admiral, not unreasonably. Because using the assets of the Panacea Cabal meant she had to explain why she needed them in the first place. The rest of the Orders weren't going to be happy she was sharing the Inquisition's dirty laundry with outsiders, but frankly, she didn't care.
To her own dismay, the more she worked to bring the panacea to mankind, the more she was beginning to think Cain had a point with his disapproval of the way the Imperium ran. As an Inquisitor, she technically outranked everyone else in the room, even Ketep, but pulling rank on them would never have brought them as far as they were now. The simple truth was that you could get a lot more of people long term by treating them with common courtesy than by threatening them with unspeakable torment at the slightest perceived failure. And besides, Ambly felt she was already keeping enough secrets as it was. After several years of stringing them along, Amberley had finally learned the name of the group of ancient inquisitors she had stumbled upon before being abducted by Drukhari. They called themselves the Concilium Revis, and together its members were a powerful block in the Damocles conclave. Amberley still had no idea what had caused them to band together despite their wildly varying expertises and ideologies, however, and had been forced to be very cautious in her investigations lest the misunderstanding that had led them to accept her within her ranks be exposed. From what little contact she'd had with the other members since that first accidental meeting, most often trading them copies of the Panacea SD or stocks of the stuff itself for favours or information, they still thought her to be the proxy of the Inquisitor whose seat she'd taken. She had no idea who that mysterious Inquisitor was, or what he or she would think if they ever returned and found out what she had supposedly done in her name. Hopefully. Should that have happened, her position would be strong enough that it wouldn't matter. Of course she couldn't say any of that to Flint. The existence of the Concilium Ravis was something she had kept secret from the rest of the Panacea Cabal, lest she drew the ire of its members upon her allies. From what she'd gleaned, only a few inquisitors of the Damocles Conclave even suspected the existence of the Concilium, because I don't believe that pretending a problem doesn't exist will solve it. She replied instead, and also because I trust everyone in this room to keep this to themselves. The air else wasn't spoken aloud, but everyone in the room heard it clearly all the same. In any case, there is little we can do on the matter at this moment, declared Ketep. Once he is found once more, we'll deal with him, and if he has allied himself with the Slorkenberg heretics, then we shall crush them both. Until then, we have more pressing concerns to address while Inquisitor Vale's agents continue the hunt. Indeed, said Lazarus, the events of Karania have rendered continuing to conceal the existence of the panacea a futile exercise. True, until now, the output of the Imperial Panacea Production Facilities had been mostly used on the same planet where it was produced, and the isolation of every Imperial world had helped keep things quiet. Furthermore, the only guardsmen who, unlike the immense majority of Imperial subjects, travelled from one star system to another until they died, to have benefited from the panacea had been located in militarum hospices, which were hardly the most public of But with how much it had been used on Corania, coupled with the fact that they had needed to withdraw to Coronus, where billions of guardsmen passed on their way to other war zones, word would inevitably spread if it hadn't already. And while some of Amberley's colleagues might not have hesitated to execute every trooper and mark them as lost in battle against the Tyranids, Amberley wasn't going to do that. Throne, have mercy. What do the rest of you think? she asked. I'm all for going public myself, shrugged Zivan. I understand it's going to get us a lot of attention we'd rather do without, but it was always going to happen eventually. By now, there are enough copies of the ST spread around that nothing short of the will of the Emperor himself could pin that particular angel back to the heavens. Everyone in this room might get killed by the morons who'll try to anyway, sure, but the Imperium at large will... The Lord General is correct, said Grise, though I feel he overstates the risks. With the possibility of monopolizing the secrets of the panacea lost, any such selfish individuals will instead seek to acquire them for themselves so as not to be left behind. My chapter is ready to send an envoy with another copy to Macridge. Once the Ultramarines are made aware of the benefits of this technology, they will make sure to spread it among their successor chapters. And since those chapters made up a good portion of all space marines in the galaxy, the benefit to the Imperium would be immense and impossible to roll back. At that point, continued the reclaimer, the only source of trouble will be the original Stiaite, which, as before, I believe should be sent to Mars, both for safekeeping and to get it off your hands before you get yourself killed because of it, inquisitor. How remarkably direct, Captain, Amberley chuckled. 
Not that Grise was wrong, of course. While the existence of the Panacea AST was still kept a secret from the galaxy at large, there were still many outside the Cabal who had learned of its existence, and there had been numerous attempts to steal it from Amberley, even while there were copies of its contents far easier to acquire. While such a course of action would be the most convenient for us, intervened Lazarus, I estimate non-negligible odds that sending the STIC to sacred Mars will result in the very internal conflicts we wish to avoid occurring there instead of here. Is this a choice we dare to make? There was a moment of silence as they all considered the dreadful possibility. Then Ketep spoke up. There is another option. One that I hesitated to bring up, but which would ensure the STA ends up serving the Emperor's will with as little internal conflict as possible in these circumstances. As Chapter Master, I have access to certain channels to the throne world. Amberly raised an eyebrow. The dilemma posed by Lazarus was precisely why she hadn't already sent the CC to the Red Planet years ago, and hearing of a possible way out of that conundrum was of great interest to her. Who exactly are you talking about, Chapter Master? There were millions, if not billions, of astropathic messages sent to Holy Terra daily, as befitted its position as the Imperium's heart, brain, and soul. Every Imperial organization worth the name was based in the soul system, if not on the throne world itself. She could only guess which one Ketip was referring to. Then he told them, and she had to admit it made perfect sense in hindsight. After all, who better to ensure that the master of mankind's will be done in this matter than his very own custodies? Alone in his quarters aboard his righteous punishment, Ernst Stavros Killian fumed with impotent fury. So much work all gone to waste because of interfering, dogmatic fools, too blind to see that, through his divine guidance, they had at last uncovered the key to turning the tide of the endless struggle against chaos. He had lost Mythius, most of the Mago's research, the loyalty of the Order of the White Rose and the facilities hidden beneath their convent, and even the steady supply of test subjects the Covenant of the Blessed had provided. They had been so close, Methius had assured him. With every test, they had gotten a little closer to perfecting the process, closer to their ultimate goal of an army of invincible psychers, soul bond to the Golden Throne, bringing ruin upon his foes. He sighed. At least he still had the shadow light. That was all that really mattered, he told himself. Everything else could be replaced, but there was only one psychic enhancer, and the self-destruct he had set up while escaping would keep his pursuers from realizing the true scope of his work until it was too late. For now, it was time to withdraw, regroup, and rebuild. Looking at a map of the Damocles Gulf, he considered his options. There were dozens of small, isolated worlds which could theoretically suit his needs, but he needed to be careful. His enemies were still on his trail, and any slip-up would bring them down on him. His gaze stopped on Toradon. A whole subsector racked by numerous warp storms, its relative isolation from the rest of the Imperium made even worse by the recent loss of the Adumbria system. There were sure to be plenty of latent psychers hiding among the ranks of the Shadow Cartels, which preyed upon the subsector's few stable shipping lanes and he still had enough resources stored away in safe locations to buy his way into a position of influence within one of the cartels. His own activities would be all but impossible to uncover amidst the mess of corruption and crime which ran rampant through the subsector. It would take time, and playing nice with such outlaw scum would rankle, but he could bear it. Yes, this would do nicely. He stood up and went to inform the captain of his righteous punishment to change their heading to the Toridan Gap. Hopefully, his master would understand and forgive him for the delay. Chapter 20 The church was a small building in the outskirts of Canopolis, which had survived the Greenskin's rampage ten standard years ago, through what many of its congregation had considered a miracle. It was surrounded by much larger buildings, constructed in the aftermath of the Orc attack as part of the reconstruction program. Father Anthony wrangled his hands and muttered a prayer under his breath. In his seven decades of life on Slorkenberg, he'd been through many things and survived situations that by all rights should have been the end of him. In recent years, he'd lived as the priest of the largest congregation of followers of the Imperial Creed in the planetary capital, practicing openly and without fear. Yet still, he couldn't help but feel nervous, which was only natural. 
for today his humble parish would be visited by none other than Siafus Cain, the man who'd led the uprising and changed the entire world through his actions. When he'd answered the insistent knocking on his door yesterday and found a squad of armoured Yusei troopers standing there, Anthony had feared the worst. But instead of whatever his imagination had conjured, the squad's sergeant had respectfully greeted him, confirmed his identity and handed him a letter, in which the uncontested master of Slorkenberg had politely inquired whether Anthony would agree to him dropping by to visit and discuss a few matters with him in person. Of course, Anthony had hurriedly written a response telling the Liberator that, yes, of course, he'd be honoured to accept. He hadn't gotten any threatening impression from the letter. And after years of dealing with his Giorba backed superiors in the ecclesiarchy, he considered himself something of an expert at reading subtle implications in official correspondence. But he wasn't an idiot. One just didn't tell the Liberator, oh no. At least not without a very good damn reason, and Anthony couldn't think of any. And so today, precisely on time, a pair of vehicles parked in front of the building and CFS Kane emerged, to the astonishment of the small crowd which had gathered to see what all the fuss was about. Father Anthony, Kane greeted the old priest with a respectful nod and a firm handshake. Thank you for agreeing to meeting with me. I know this must all be very unexpected. It certainly had been. As a member of the ecclesiarchy born and raised on Slorkenberg, Anthony had been taught that rebelling against the Imperium was a sin worthy of damnation, just like the worship of anything but the god-emperor and his saint. But then, he'd also been taught that it was the Geobus's emperor-given right to do whatever they pleased with their subjects, and that the misery and cruelty they inflicted upon the population of Slorkenberg was all according to his design which he had never accepted. And if his teachers could be so clearly wrong about one thing, who knew what else they were wrong about? At the very least, the priest refused to believe the god-emperor would object to the removal of the Giorbas from power. As for the new faiths which had blossomed on Slorkenberg since the uprising, well, he simply didn't know enough to decide one way or the other. All he could do was continue to care for those who still chose to believe in the imperial creed, despite everything and hoped the god-emperor would understand when their souls arrived at the foot of his throne. It certainly was a surprise, but an unwelcome one, he said to the most powerful man on the planet. Please, come in. As Cain followed Anthony, his retinue remained outside, including his Exynos blood ward and personal aid, setting up a perimeter to ensure the Liberator and his host weren't disturbed. The wooden doors slammed close behind the two of them, with a sound Anthony tried very hard not to think about as an executioner's axe coming down. The main room of the church had enough pews to sit a hundred or so people, an elevated altar for him to deliver sermons at, and the most precious item in the building, a five metres high statue of the god emperor, which, despite being older than Anthony, was still in perfect condition. The statue depicted the master of mankind in the aspect Anthony most liked to think of him as a malevolent protector, arms raised to shield his people from the weight of the galaxy's evil, represented as a large sphere of stone with vague, threatening shapes carved into it. To his surprise, Cain made the sign of the Aquila while looking at the statue as the two of them walked down the aisle between the rows of pews. Do you still pray to him, Lord? Anthony asked tentatively as they stopped at the foot of the altar. Not much these days. No, Can replied with a rueful smile. I don't think he would approve of many of the choices I've made, but this is his house, so I should show some respect. It is not for us to know his mind, only to try to live as best we could according to his teachings, quoted Anthony, before adding. Unfortunately, here on Slorkenberg, those teachings have long since been corrupted to suit the purposes of evil men. Quite. If you don't mind me asking, Father Cain continued, how did you make it through the uprising? I know the crowds were a little, shall we say, over-enthusiastic in their hunts. That certainly was one way to put it. When the word had spread and the capital had shaken under the blows of clashing forces, for one terrible moment, Anthony had been afraid that the entire city would succumb to madness as its population finally let out centuries of suppressed rage at the Geobus exaction. He couldn't blame the people for their anger, but that hadn't stopped him from worrying about the damage their hatred would do to their souls. Thankfully, it hadn't come to that. Tempers had cooled down, 
and wrath had turned to jubilation as the uprising's triumph gave way to days of celebration, in great part. Anthony knew, thank to the man before him, by killing the governor, Cain had given all their revenge to all the people of Slorkenberg, and his leadership had ensured things remained more or less under control. The people who knew me sheltered and protected me, explained Anthony. In the past, I have participated in certain unlawful activities to prevent what exactions I could, then remembering who he was talking to and that there was no longer any need to hide the truth. He clarified, mostly by hiding people who were being hunted by the enforcers within the church and stealing tithe funds to buy food for starving families. They remembered it and came to my aid in my time of need. This building was spared the flames for the same reason. I see. That is nice to hear. And how have things been since the uprising? asked Cain. I know the laws made it clear all were free to worship whoever they chose, but there's a difference between making something a law and making it reality. Have there been any difficulties? The people of Slorkenberg have suffered much under the previous regime, said Anthony, phrasing his words carefully, and all of it was endorsed by the ecclesiarchy at the time. I do not blame them for the distrust they feel toward the imperial creed. The fault in this lies solely with my former superiors for failing so catastrophically in their sacred duties. So there have been difficulties. Then, said Cain, frowning. Only minor things, Anthony hastened to explain, lest the liberator misunderstand, shouted insults as I walk by, mostly, and a few instances of minor vandalism, anti-imperial slogans painted on the walls, trash cans emptied before the door, that sort of things. All done by young people who were told of their families suffering and lashed out against the closest thing to those responsible they could find. Nothing a good talk with their parents couldn't solve. To be perfectly honest, compared to the grief I got from my superiors, things are much improved. An all-too-common story on this world, sighed Kane. That is some comfort, at least. Still, if things ever escalate to the point you feel in danger, don't hesitate to contact me for help. It is important to me that those who still keep faith with him be allowed to do so peacefully. In that moment... Father Anthony experienced something akin to revelation, like all imperial subjects. Siaphas Cain would have been raised to worship the god-emperor, though the priest was certain the religious teachings he'd received at the Schola Progenium had been quite different from those of Slorkenberg. More than anyone else on the planet, he must have realized what a perversion of the imperial creed the allies of the Giorbas had created in their efforts to keep the people subservient. Rather than thinking the god-emperor had abandoned him like most of the people of Slorkenberg who'd embraced the new faiths, Khan thought of himself as unworthy of following the master of mankind. Should the need arise, I will do so, Anthony promised Cain. Thank you. Now, on to the real reason for my presence here. Cain took a deep breath before continuing. In truth, father, I've come to seek spiritual guidance. Anthony blinked. That wasn't what he'd expected, but his decades of experience didn't fail him, and he smoothly replied, What little wisdom I have to offer is yours, Lord. Would you care for us to discuss this sat down in my kitchen? Perhaps... Ideas, can swallowed, turning his gaze away from the statue of him on earth. Yes, that sounds lovely. Five minutes later, the priest and the liberator were sat at the small wooden table where Anthony took his meals, a couple of glasses and a pitcher of water between them. For a moment, Anthony had considered bringing out the mass wine, but then thought better of it. This was probably going to be a conversation he'd need all his wits for, and at his age, he couldn't handle alcohol nearly as well as in his youth. For one low moment, they simply sat together in silence. Then Cain spoke. I'm afraid, father. I struggle to imagine what could scare a man such as you, replied Anthony. Oh, there are plenty of things that scare me, Cain chuckled. But that's not what I want to talk about. I am afraid of what I might become. I see. Or, oh, well, I think I do. You wield immense power, more than you ever expected, I assume. Anthony didn't know much about the workings of the Imperium beyond Slorkenberg, but from what little he understood, a commissar, which was what the Imperium had decided Cain should be, would only ever hold authority over a single regiment of the Imperial Guard. Absolute authority. Yes, including the right to summarily execute anyone at any time for any reason. 
but nothing compared to the billions who now looked up to the Liberator for guidance. Do you fear that power could twist you until you come to resemble the dual bus? Then? No, decided Kane after thinking on it for a moment. The rest of the council wouldn't let that happen. Well, then Anthony began. I'm afraid of becoming something worse than the dual bars ever were. Father, Bing cut him off, and it was like a dam had burst as the words kept pouring out of his mouth. I, the other members of the council, trust my judgment, far more than they should, really. They'd stop me from descending into pointless hedonism. That much I'm sure of. But there is so much more we could do. There was a pause as the Liberator caught his breath. Then he continued in a haunted tone of voice. I have put limits on the Council's activities, forbidden certain courses of action I believe would only hurt us all in the long run. But I've seen with my own eyes the benefits these paths can bring to Slorkenberg, and to me personally most of all in the short term. And while the Council accepts my reasoning on these matters, I know that should I change my mind, they would gleefully enable me, convinced we were doing the right thing every step of the way. And in the end, I would become a monster worse than anything in the fiery sermons of your corrupt superiors. There would be nothing and no one to stop me. The Liberator finished, sounding and looking genuinely disturbed, until the Imperium came at last to destroy us all, and by that time, I'm terrified that death would truly be salvation, just like that madman Karamazov ranted. There was another moment of silence as Anthony drank from his cup, thinking, and there is nothing to stop me from taking this knife. Anthony picked up the corresponding piece of cutlery to illustrate his point, walk outside and start stabbing people with it. The ability to do evil lies within all of us, Lord. You may not trust yourself, but in all the years since the uprising, when have you erred? When have you not done right by the people you chose to protect when you decided to follow the spirit rather than the letter of your oaths? I've just been lucky, the Liberator muttered. Luckier than anyone has any right to be, and it won't last forever. Sooner or later, I'll make a mistake. That is almost certain, admitted Anthony. Nobody is perfect, not even you, but making mistakes is only human, Lord. As long as you recognize them as such and learn from them, I do not believe you will ever fall so far as you're afraid you might. And if you're still worried, he added with a smile, then here is a trick you can use as a core making any big decision. Ask yourself what kind of example you are giving your daughter. I've found parenthood can change people, inspire them to be their better self. The public announcement that the Liberator had adopted the child he'd rescued from the den of evil on Adumbria had been made three days ago, to widespread jubilation. Apparently, Kane had wanted to wait until her long-term survival was confirmed before making his decision. Anthony'd heard a number of theories as to the girl's origins, for surely the thralls of decay wouldn't have used just any child as the keystone of their vile work. The wildest was that young Zerea was actually the child of the Liberator and the martyred Lady Emeli, whose unborn spirit had been stolen by the vile spirits which served the power of rot in an attempt to break Cain's will. That's another thing, said Cain softly. I've no idea how to be a parent. Anthony felt his throat tighten at the reminder that, for all his strength and courage, the Liberator was still a relatively young man, orphaned at a very young age and raised without anything even remotely resembling familial affection in the cold, soulless halls of the Imperium Scholar Progenium. It was frankly a miracle he was as well adjusted as he was, never mind possessed of such strong will. Anthony had heard stories of the Scholar during his training as a priest, and they still filled him with dread to this day. Well, I don't have any personal experience on the subject. But from what I've seen over my life, nobody ever really has any clue either, he jested. As long as you make sure she is loved and knows it, though, you should be fine. After that, the two spent about an hour discussing various topics, from the various policies of the Liberation Council to child-rearing methods. Anthony had witnessed the ones the Liberator himself remembered from his time at the Scholar were, frankly, nearly as horrifying as the rumors Anthony had heard before, and though Can was clearly not intending to use them on Zeraya, the fact he spoke of them so freely was as worrying as it was reassuring. Then, after a final handshake, Cain departed, leaving Anthony briefly alone before the members of his congregation rushed into the building to ask him what in the God Emperor's name had just happened. Not only was everything he'd talked about with the Liberator covered by the secret of the confessional, 
He knew there were several very influential, very dangerous people who'd be very angry with him if he shared Kane's private doubt. The next day, Anthony received another message from the palace. This one contained an official statement that his funding request had been approved. A box containing ten doses of panacea and a handwritten note from the Liberator thanking him for his time, explaining that the medicine was for his bad leg, which the Liberator had known, and asking whether he'd be available for further discussions in the future. Though he doubted Cain would thank him for it, Anthony made sure to include him in his prayers to the Master of Mankind the next time he led Mass. When Zariah was six months old, she saw the sky of Slorkenberg for the first time. Since she'd seen other skies for the first time, she'd spent her time in a warm, white, bright space, with a red blanket wrapped around her. Lots of different people had come, made noises, then gone. First warm liquids, then solid stuff she'd to break with her teeth. Time passed, until someone else came, who didn't smell of metal and oil. She recognized him. This was the one who'd taken her out of the bad place. This was the one who'd carried her outside of the dark and showed her the beautiful purple skies. He wasn't surrounded by metal like he'd been then, but she still recognized him. Gently, he picked her up, still wrapped in her red blanket, and carried her outside. They passed by lots of other people, and then she saw the sky again. This one wasn't purple, it was blue. That didn't make it any less beautiful. When Zarea was two years old, she realized she wasn't like other children. It was kind of obvious, given how she was already a good couple of heads taller than the other kids she'd been introduced to a mere three months ago. They were growing too, but she was growing faster. And they weren't dumb, but she was getting smarter. She could talk better than them, and read and write too, while they were still looking at picture books and needed their caretakers to read the words written in big, blocky letters for them. She didn't understand why that was, so she did what she always did when she didn't understand something. Daddy, she asked, when he came to pick her up that afternoon, once he'd finished all his boring grown-up work, why am I getting big? He smiled and ruffled her hair in the way he knew she liked. Because you are a very special girl, he told her. She pouted. That didn't answer anything at all, e. everyone was special, just like everyone was important. Daddy had told her that, and so had the other grown-up. Why am I special? she asked again. His smile went down a little of who your mommy was. She was a very special lady with very special powers. And since you're her daughter, you have the same powers, which is why you're growing up so fast. Zaria paused. The other children at the palace's daycare had mommies she knew. They came to pick them up when their day was done, just like daddy, although sometimes their dads came to pick them up too. But she was always picked up by daddy or by Uncle Jurgen when there were too many people who needed his help but didn't happen often, and Daddy always made sure to spend more time with her the next day to make up for it. Where is Mommy? she asked in a small voice. Can I see her? I want to see her. Daddy's face turned sad, and he picked her up and hugged her. I'm sorry, Z. He whispered in her ear using his special name for her, but your Mommy is gone, and she isn't coming back. Oh, she said. She didn't know what else to say. He smiled at her, but he was still sad but that doesn't mean you are alone. I don't remember my mommy either, you know. When Zarea was three years old, she realized that not all her memories were her own. The not hers memories weren't as clear as the ones she knew were hers. They were more like nightmares, returning night after night to haunt her with images of dark corridors, tubes full of greenish liquid, skulls being added on everything, and giants in yellow armor shouting angrily at her as she tried to run away. She didn't like them. They were full of pain, but that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was how empty she felt in them. She wasn't happy, or sad, or anything. It was wrong, and she didn't like it. One day, she finally mustered the courage to ask Daddy about them. These are your mother's memories. He told her as the two of them sat down before the fireplace, as heavy snow fell outside, covering the city in a thick white blanket. Zarea was wrapped inside the red cape that had been Daddy's before, and which she'd always kept close when she went to bed, even now. I knew there was a chance of you inheriting some of them, but I'd hoped that wouldn't happen. She didn't have a good life. I wanted, I still want, you to be free from that. What was her name? She asked softly. Lejenstrasse, Daddy replied. She was very strong and very alone. 
That's why she died in the end. You were taken by one of my enemies then, who brought you to Adumbria, where I rescued you. So I'm really not your daughter then, she said, hating how small her voice sounded. She'd always known that, of course. The story of how Daddy had rescued her was known across the entire planet. She'd heard other people talk about it when they thought she couldn't hear, which at first she'd thought was silly, but then she'd realized she could hear a lot better than the other kids. You are my daughter in every way that matters, he immediately replied, getting up from his chair and gently seizing her chin to force her to look at him. Family isn't defined by blood ties. She looked into his face, finding only sincerity there, and the bad feeling in her chest abated. As being her daughter, why I can do what I can do what I can do? She asked. A couple of months ago, Daddy had taken her to visit a greenhouse which was called that because of all the plants inside which were green even if all the ones outside were red and orange and brown because it was autumn. A butterfly had landed on her hand, and she'd found it so beautiful she'd wanted it to stay with her. And then her hand had opened up and swallowed it. She'd run to Daddy crying, and when she'd told her what happened, he'd explained that this was a unique gift of hers, not too different from the other kids at the cliché who Uncle Jurgen taught from time to time, the ones who could move things with their mind, or know stuff about objects just by touching them. And just like these other children, Zariah needed to be careful, because she could hurt someone real bad if she wasn't. Yes, replied Daddy. She could do the same things as you, and a lot more besides. What else could she do? Zarea asked again, her curiosity peaked. I don't know, he shrugged. We'll have to find out together if you want. Yes, eh? She nodded frantically. I want Very well, I'll set something up. But remember, I, you have to not use these special talents of yours where other people can see it. Why? She cocked her head to the side, not understanding. The kids at the crochet can. Because of the people who killed your mother, he said gently. If they hear about you, then they'll come to kill you too. And I'll do my best to keep you safe, but I'm not strong enough to beat them. So we have to keep it secret, understood? At the time, Zuria couldn't imagine anyone stronger than Daddy but she nodded anyway. No matter how quickly she grew up, she knew there were still many things the grown-ups knew that she didn't. When Zariah was four years old, she met Daddy's Damon girlfriend. It was the anniversary of the uprising, which was when Daddy and his friends had fought the bad men who ruled the world and saved everyone. Daddy had taken her to a big, but not as big as the palace place that was called the House of Remembrance. There were lots of interesting things in the house, but Daddy had to give a big, boring speech, so Zariah sneaked away to explore the building. After some time wandering across the rooms and climbing up, because, she reasoned, that was where you put the best stuff, she arrived in a room that resonated with a song she didn't hear with her ears, and in which stood a statue of a very pretty lady. She was looking at the statue when its eyes started glowing with a very pretty green light, and the statue started talking without moving its lips. Hello, Soraya. It, uh, no, she said in a gentle voice. Who are you? asked Soraya. Daddy had taught her about daemons, but somehow this didn't feel dangerous. I am Emily, and I love your father very much. Of course you love him, said Soraya, not understanding why Emily would say something so obvious. Everyone loves Daddy. He is the best. That he is, Soraya, Emily chuckled. That he is. But you are mistaken, dear. Not everyone loves ciphers. She frowned. Everyone I know does. Emily chuckled again, but it was a little sad this time. Yes, dear. Everyone in the world loves him. But there are other worlds, little one. And there people live who hate him and want him to die. Zarea felt something cold and unpleasant in her chest at the statue lady's words. Daddy couldn't die. He couldn't. Why? She asked. Why do they want to hurt him? Because they're scared of him, replied Emily. Because they've grown up being told Cyphers and the others on Slorkenberg are dangerous, but mostly because they're bad people and they don't like it when other people are better than them. I won't let that happen, Zaria swore. I'll protect him. I'll... Oh dear, Emily cut her off gently. That's not what Cyphers wants. He is strong, little one. Stronger than even you know. Maybe you fighting with him would help but that's not what he wants for you. Then what does he want? 
You already know the answer to that question, little one. Above all, he wants you to be happy. That was true, Zarea thought. But she still wanted to make sure Daddy was safe, and she told him he Then, if you really want, you'll need to ask your father to teach you how to fight. He won't agree if you tell him that's to protect him, though. You need to tell him you want to be able to defend yourself so that he won't have to worry about you. Zareya nodded. That made sense. Daddy could be silly like that sometimes. I will. Thank you, Miss Emmy. You're welcome, dear. Now, I think you should get back to your father. I can feel him searching for you, and we don't want him to be worried. Now do we... She gasped. Right. Goodbye, Miss... Goddess, goodbye. Oh, and whilst thing mess... Don't tell Fass we talked, all right? I want to tell him myself the next time we meet. Oh, oh, sure. Then she ran out of the room. Like Miss Emily had said, Daddy was looking for her and looked very relieved when he saw her. When he asked where she'd been, Zeraya told him she'd gone looking at the exhibits, which wasn't a lie. So it was all right. Besides, Miss Emmy loved Daddy, so doing what she told her couldn't be bad, right? When Zariah was six years old, she was formally introduced to the rest of the planet. By then, her accelerated growth had finally stabilized, leaving her looking ten years older than she actually was. She wore her black hair long and unbound, reaching to the small of her back, while wearing a purple dress that matched the color of her eyes. The color she first remembered them being, and which she'd kept in all her public appearances. She wore a short dagger at her waist, which despite its ornate look was still very much a lethal weapon. It had taken a lot of convincing, but in the end Daddy'd agreed to let her get some training with militia so that she could defend herself without having to fall back on her unique abilities. She was training those too, but in a more discreet location, and with Uncle Jurgen's constant supervision. Her name day celebration was a large event, accompanied by celebrations across the planet, throw as Daddy had half-jokingly told her. While the people of Slorkenberg undoubtedly loved her, they would also use any excuse to throw a party. Daddy gave a speech. She unwrapped a lot of presents from everyone, and then it was time to eat good food and drink fruit juices and other non-alcoholic beverages, listen to the music and talk with people. People like Father Anthony, who was looking very out of place in his priestly garments with the symbol of the Aquila embroidered on the cloth. The Liberator's Confessor, Zarai had heard him called. He didn't have any official role in the Liberation Council, but was effectively the leader of the Emperor worshippers on Slorkenberg by virtue of his proximity to Daddy, and the one who brought their concerns to him. Hello, Father, she greeted him. Ah, uh, hello, Mrs. Zarai. Happy name day. I hope you're enjoying yourself. I am. Can we talk in private? I have something I'd like to ask you. He raised an eyebrow in surprise before nodding. Of course. I'm always at your father's and yours disposal. The two of them moved to a small balcony. After taking a moment to center herself, Zirea asked, Do you think the emperor hates me? Well, I have heard a lot about you from your father, miss, replied the old priest after a small pause as he considered her question. And while he isn't exactly unbiased, nothing the liberators told me makes me think he would disapprove of you. Even though I'm a mutant, she pressed. Daddy had told her how dangerous revealing her full capabilities would be, but saying that much was fine. Everyone on Slorkenberg had seen the vid of Daddy carrying her out of the collapsing lair and could see how fast she had grown since. Oh, I have no doubt my old superiors would want you burned at the pyre. He scoffed, waving a hand dismissively. But if you'll pardon my language, they can all go suck a goat's tits. You are here, alive, loved and loving. And unless I'm gravely mistaken about your character, you live in accordance with your father's laws regarding the treatment of others. I think the Emperor has more important things to worry about than one young girl who isn't hurting anyone. Zeria smiled. Sure, Anthony didn't know the truth about her nature, but she couldn't help but think he had a point. Even Daddy, on those rare occasions when he spoke with her about religion, had told her he'd always thought the Emperor had better things to do than keep an eye on everyone in the galaxy. Not many people on Slorkenberg believed in the Emperor's divinity these days, but Daddy was very insistent that he was real, and so were Auntie Christabel and Uncle Jafar, even if they didn't like him and thought about him in a very different way Father Anthony did. 
as long as she didn't become a threat to the Imperium, he would probably leave her alone. Of course, like Daddy had warned her, just because the Emperor didn't want something didn't mean the Imperials wouldn't do it anyway. Thank you, Father, she told Old Priest. Any time, my dear. And speaking of having better things to do, don't you think you should enjoy your party rather than spend time talking to an old man like me? You're right, Zarea decided. With one final nod, she turned back to the rest of the room, determined to drag Daddy into a dance with her. As the celebrations for Zarea's name day died down, I withdrew to my quarters. There, sat on my favorite chair, I watched the sun set over the planetary capital while nursing the half glass of Amasek. That, much to my chagrin, would be my only drink for the evening. I had been forced to cut down on my drinking in recent years, though gods knew my position hadn't become any less stressful. There hadn't been any new large-scale military deployments since the cleansing of Skitterfall, although given the reports I was getting from the shipyards in Adumbria, it was only a matter of time before I couldn't hold the rest of the council back. But Slorkenberg itself had provided plenty of opportunity for fate to attempt to catch up with me in the last six years. There had been the incident with the creche for the gifted, the corner of the Liberation Palace reserved for Slorkenberg's psycho children, where they were trained to control their abilities and where those of their parents willing to move lived as well. Despite the wards put in place precisely to prevent this, one of the youngest children had been possessed by a minor daemon of Nurgle while I was visiting. I'd barely managed to keep Militia from killing a five years old in front of the pitcasters, which had left me dodging projectile vomit, which had eaten right through the floor and walls for a good five minutes, before the cult magi had arrived and performed an exorcism ritual that had sent the fiend back to the warp without harming the child. Then there'd been the live demonstration of one of the Borg's pet project, a fully automated combat unit, based on the industrial automaton Stias design we'd recovered aboard Emelie's gift. No sooner had it finished destroying the dummies arranged before it for the demonstration that it had turned its autocannons on the observer's lounge, having identified everyone inside as enemies. If not for my paranoia and quick reflexes, that single robot would have killed half the Liberation Council in one fell swoop, and most importantly me among them. Needless to say, the Borg in question had been thoroughly shamed by his peers. Last I'd heard, he was doing maintenance on Canopolis's sewage system and was likely to remain there for the foreseeable future. Even something as innocuous as the premiere of the latest Holo supposedly based on my exploits had proven unsafe. And not just because of how painful it always was to watch such blatant propaganda, which apparently the plebs just couldn't get enough of. That particular piece had been based on and named after the cleansing of Skitterfall, a sequel to Faith and Duty, which was all about my confrontation with Karamazov aboard the Mad Inquisitor's flagship and against alien foes, which covered the double orc Drukhari incursion. I could only give thanks to the Emperor that, in the later case, I'd managed to nick the idea of adding a romantic subplot between me and Militia before my blood would heard of it, though the fact I'd been forced to let the screenwriters add not-so-subtle implications of one between my character and Inquisitor, Vales was only slightly less worrying. Despite my clear instructions, some moron on the cleansing of Skitterfall's production team had thought it a good idea to acquire unscrubbed, original footage of the battle and incorporate it into some of the fighting scenes. At least the fool had been among the first to die when some of the Nurglite daemons projected before the audience had walked out of the projection field and started killing people. On another occasion, I jumped on the chance to take a trip back to Adambria on the five years' anniversary of the Kanite Protectorate's establishment. Leaving Zariah without me for so long had been a difficult choice, but in the end the opportunity to get away from yet another celebration in my honour had been too much for me to resist at the time. I'd quite reasonably thought that any celebration thrown on Adambria would be much smaller than what I'd seen the Handmaidens plan, what with the planet's economy still recovering from a Nurglite invasion and the complete severance of the trade routes that brought so much activity to the system. In this I'd been correct. Even if the people of Adambria had clearly done their best to welcome me, undoubtedly out of fear of what my reaction to any perceived slight might me. I was, after all, only the lesser evil in their eyes compared to the infect. What I hadn't anticipated was the coup attempt of Vice Queen Castine's second-in-command, Colonel Jeanette Sulla, 
whose loyalty to the Golden Throne had driven her to try to kill me and Regina before ending her own life, fortunately for everyone, especially me. She'd made her move at the very same time a group of shadowy monstrosities, which Militia had later identified as mandrakes, natives of the same hellish city as the rest of her kind, had ambushed us. By the time the last Sinus assassins had been dispatched by my aide and Bloodwood while I cowered behind a large piece of furniture, pretending to be looking after Regina's safety, Sul had been yet another victim of my inflated reputation, and had offered her life an apology for her treason, which, mindful of the glare Regina had been sending my way, I'd refused, instead giving her some platitude about how she'd err atonement for her honest mistake by continuing to serve the people of Adumbria to the best of her abilities. Finally, there had been that time just two weeks ago, when I'd gone to attend the opening of Canopolis' great zoological garden, which gathered animals and plants from all across the planet and put them into artificial reconstructions of their natural habitats for the viewing pleasure of the pleb. I couldn't see the appeal myself, but the Borgs and Saientians had enjoyed the technical challenges. The Slanishi were desperate for ways to introduce the population to new experiences, and the Cornates had appreciated the opportunity to go hunt what passed for dangerous game on the vacation world. I had been resting in a small room, checking my clothes were in order before giving yet another speech and cutting the symbolic ribbon which would signify the garden's opening, when a black-furred megafelid had emerged from the storage room where he'd been sleeping after sneaking out of his enclosure. I'd later learned that this particular beast had been brought to Slorkenberg as a pet by one of the most decadent tourists, only to escape a few days before the uprising had rendered his owner quite definitely incapable of caring for him, though the locals had promptly adopted him before sending him to the zoo. The megafelid had been born in captivity and had never hunted for his food. More than that, since his prior owner wasn't terminally stupid, he'd been subjected to various procedures which had thoroughly neutered his predatory instinct. He was completely harmless. But at the time, I'd no idea of that fact. All I'd seen was a three meters long, one meter high mass of predatory muscles, and a jaw full of fangs that could tear me apart like paper, staring at me with golden eyes. Acting on instinct, I had slowly walked out of the room, and the beast had followed me all the way to the podium, where I'd forced myself to deliver my speech like everything was normal, lest the predator react to my fear and pounce on me. Obviously, given Jurgen and Militia were both here, I had been safe from the moment I'd stepped outside, but that had still been quite the experience, and it had resulted in an otherwise bog-standard speech being broadcast to the entire planet, while a megafield wandered around stage, sniffing everything curiously. At least it had done wonders for the zoo's attendance. Of course, no sooner had I returned home that I'd been jumped on by Zariah, who had asked to go see the ape big kitty herself, which I was perfectly fine with, and whether she could bring him home with her, which I most certainly wasn't. Unfortunately, my ability to say E.O. to the weapon of mass destruction, currently living as my adopted daughter, hadn't really improved with time which was why the cleaners of the Liberation Palace now had to deal with the shed fur of Zeroya's beloved Alsai, as she decided to name the inoffensive predator. And those were only some of the misadventures which had happened to me since my return from Adumbria. Combined with daily stresses of keeping a planetary government run by faithless heretics functioning, I really would have appreciated being able to find relief at the bottom of a glass. It was just that, with how little free time my duties left me with, I had to spend most of it in Zerea's company, making sure she grew up as well adjusted as possible and didn't decide to kill everyone on Slorkenberg and then in the Damocles Gulf one day, and drinking in her presence would hardly have fitted the image of a caring parent. I was trying very hard to project, not accounting for the fact that the very idea of a drunk Zeraya was utterly terrifying, of course. She probably couldn't get drunk to begin with, but I wasn't going to risk it. I was considering finishing my drink and going to bed when, after a respectful knock on the door to announce his entrance, Jurgen came in. Beg your pardon, sir, but there's something I would like to talk to you about. It's about the young miss, he added, meaning Zeraya, for all that she called him Uncle Jurgen. My aide had steadfastly refused to address her with any other term, but what he believed protocol demanded. What, eh? I asked him, immediately alarmed. Is something wrong? Has something happened to her at the party? No, nothing of the sort, he reassured me. 
The fact that even he, who spent more time near me than anyone else besides Melissia, but she was a pain-devouring Xenos, and so didn't count had bought my act as Zariah's loving father was quite heartening. I was just thinking, isn't it? Time for her to get out of the palace more? What do you mean? I asked, puzzled. Zariah left the palace quite often, either accompanying me on trips across Slorkenberg or to visit places on her own well. Without me, she was always accompanied by a solid escort of either Jurgen or another high-ranking member of the Liberation Council's bureaucracy, whom I felt could be trusted with her for several hours without my direct supervision. I mean that everyone the young miss has interacted with in her life has seen her as your daughter first, and her own person second, my aide explained, getting to mingle with other people her own age. Well, her own mental age, you know what I mean, can only be good for her and there are plenty of schools or universities she'd fit right in now. She wouldn't be able to simply mingle outside the palace either, I pointed out. Everyone would know she is my daughter. I trailed off. Jurgen was staring patiently at me, and I suddenly realized why. Of course, Zariah could easily change her appearance so that nobody would link her to her official identity, and I could get a fake name and background for her with a simple vox call to Jafar. I see your point, I conceded but I worry. Specifically, I worried some idiotic juvie would try to play an ill-thought prank on her, and she'd respond by devouring them alive in front of her entire class. But there was no need to say to Jurgen. Of course you do, sir, he nodded, clearly indulging me. But you can't keep her close forever. She needs to step outside her childhood home, big as hers might be. He was right, I realized. Trying to restrain Zarea's activities overmuch could only end badly, as the murdered shades of countless Assassinorum's agents working on the Maras Temple could attest. Even a gilded cage was still a cage, and could breed resentment in its cap. And I most definitely didn't want Zaria to resent me. An ordinary teenage girl's resentment I could have dealt with easily, but this was Zaria, whose mother had been one stroke of luck away from depopulating an entire segmentum. I'll talk with her about it tomorrow, I promised Jurgen. If she agrees, I'll ask Jafar to help set it up. I had, at the time, no idea of how much more stress this decision would end up causing me, but looking back I cannot say I wouldn't do it again if I had the chance. What do you mean? You didn't find anything? Inquisitor Tannenberg of the Ordo Hereticus wasn't used to failure from his underling. Unlike some of his peers, this wasn't because he always punished it by death. He was experienced enough to realize that sometimes failure was inevitable, and that killing his own servants would make the others more likely to lie to him or conceal vital information out of self-preservation. That didn't mean he never executed his subordinates, though, and right now, he definitely felt the urge to do so. His interrogator, currently standing on the other side of his desk within his office, clearly realized that as he hurried to explain. We found the scholar in which Cain was raised without issue, Lord. Following the parchment trail from the ship which brought him to Slorkenberg was easy, if time-consuming, and once we'd found the scholar, we were able to interrogate its faculty and confirm that this was indeed the institution which hosted Cain from childhood to his graduation as a commissar. And did you find any sign of corruption or incompetence within the scholar itself? asked Tannenberg. I find it difficult to believe none of the instructors noticed anything wrong about this heretic. The records of Cain's time in the Scholar were made available to us, and we were able to confirm they hadn't been tempered with, continued the interrogator. There was nothing remarkable about them. Cain was a middling student, except for a talent in swordsmanship that was noted by his melee instructor, and a completely clean discipline record, which in itself was suspicious as Tannenberg still remembered enough of what it was like to be a juvie to know that a clean record was more evidence of a great ability to not get caught than a complete purity of spirit. As for Cain's talent for swordsmanship, that much had been demonstrated when he'd killed Karamazov. We made sure to investigate the entire faculty, but found no sign of heresy whatsoever, said the interrogator. They were all as faithful and devoted to the God Emperor as one might expect from people chosen to join the Scholar Progenium, which means that Kain's corruption both preceded his joining the Scholar and was subtle enough to elude them, said Tannenberg, making finding out where he came from even more important and your failure all the more severe. 
The interrogator quailed under the Inquisitor's glare. However, he hadn't reached his current rank in Tannenberg's organization by being faint of heart, and he rallied quickly enough which left the witch hunter reluctantly impressed. The parchment trail ends at the Skola, Lord. Cain was brought in one day with another shipment of orphans. The records say his parents died in the Imperial Guard, and his old teachers told us he sometimes made comments about having been born in an underhut, but nothing else. Given the reprogramming all scholar students go through to erase past ties, they thought nothing of it. Someone must have brought Cain to the scholar, insisted Tannenberg, and they must know where he came from. The ship in question was lost to the warp with all hands years before Cain's graduation, explained the interrogator, and it was responsible for collecting suitable orphans from half a dozen sectors. Without more information to tighten our search area, it would be the work of decades to find more, if not centuries. I see, murmured Tannenberg. Very well. Leave me and go rest. I will consider what you've told me and summon you when I've a new assignment for you and your team. The interrogator bowed deeply, trying and failing to hide the relief he felt at being dismissed, and promptly departed, leaving Tannenberg alone with his thoughts. Given what he knew of the administratum's record-keeping, the youngster's estimation was likely on the optimistic side. He didn't doubt that the name of Kane's homeworld was recorded somewhere within the massive data stacks of the Imperium scribes, and that with enough time and resources, it could be found. The question was, would it be worth the effort? The rest of the Concilium Ravus still thought of Slorkenberg's rebellion as a minor issue compared to the greater threats to the Damocles Gulf. For a time, Tannenberg had agreed with them, though it had rankled to allow any blemish upon his divine dominion to linger. But when he'd learned that Inquisitor Vale had returned from her mysterious journey to that renegade world sixteen years ago with no less a prize than a long-lost DC of incredible potential in her possession, the witch hunter had reconsidered his position. Then he'd received word from his diviners that the Adumbria system, which had been quarantined and declared Padisha, after a virulent warp plague had taken root among its population, had been rescued from certain doom by none other than Cain. No doubt he'd used his own panacea to deal with the issue, and the people of Adumbria, knowing the Imperium had turned its back on them, had then been easy marks for someone as charismatic as the arch-heretic of Slorkenberg to manipulate into joining his so-called Kainite protectorate. The only question was whether Khan had just taken advantage of an opportunity or had orchestrated the plague in the first place. At least Inquisitor Vale's ongoing efforts to spread the use of the panacea throughout the sector and beyond would neutralize that diplomatic tool. Tannenberg reflect clearly the young woman had learned of Adumbria's unlikely salvation and accelerated her plans in response to ensure the taint of Slorkenberg's Heresy was contained while the Imperium dealt with more pressing threat. However, the witch hunter was more and more convinced that letting the Protectorate alone was a mistake. But he needed more information before committing his own ever-stretched thin assets. Hence why he'd dispatched a team of acolytes to investigate the past of Slorkenberg's so-called liberator. To be completely honest, it had been a minor errand, something he'd ordered out of curiosity and because the team in question needed some time to recover from a far more dangerous assignment, hunting witches in a hive city which had left a quarter of their number dead, and the rest in various states of injury. Tannenberg didn't believe for a moment the loss of the ship which had brought Cain to the Scola Progenium was a coincidence. Of course, Cain himself would have been far too young at the time to arrange for it to happen, which meant there had to be some figure or cabal behind his sudden rise to heretical power on Slorkenberg, manipulating events from the shadows. The list of potential suspects was too long to bother naming. The Elder, the traitor legions, any of the subtler daemons of chaos, countless cults which continued to plague the Imperium despite the best efforts of his ordo any one of them, could be responsible for erasing the trail of their pawn, and trying to find that trail again would only cost him more resources he didn't have to spare, with very little to gain one's origins while interesting, were not nearly as important as what he was doing right now. Leading a successful rebellion against the Imperium of Man, one which had already spread its heretical ideology to another world. This, the Inquisitor decided, had to stop. Fortunately, if Cain was as important to the entire Slorkenberg heresy as he appeared, then the solution was obvious. 
Tannenberg pressed a series of runes on the communicator built into his desk, then waited for a few seconds until the light indicating a secure link had been established. Get ready, agent, he declared. I have a new mission for you.